Hello once again to my Bad M107 students. Um, by this time you're probably getting pretty tired of watching my bobbing head in these videos. Uh, for that I think uh, I apologize and blame COVID-19. Um, anyway, we have finished Chapter 8 on corporations, which is um, a form of business organization that can be used excellently to transfer and shift the risk of loss from the people that own the business to the uh, corporate entity itself. Um, and now we are going to get into chapter nine, uh, which deals in part with insurance, which is another way of shifting the risk from the business uh, to another entity, i.e. the insurance company. Chapter nine is broken down into three parts, um, and that's why it's called miscellany. Um, the first part is insurance, um, and we're going to get into that today. Uh, the second part is intellectual property. Um, I did a video a few years ago for this section um, as the fourth hour activity um, because we did not we do not have enough time in the course itself to cover this uh, much material. And then the third part is estate planning, which has an important element for business. Okay, so we're going to do insurance today. Um, and the other video is um, already on uh, eLearn, Moodle. And um, you'll notice that it says a different chapter number and it says um, a, a different section number. I think it might start off saying BEDM 107, section 81 or something. Ignore that. The material is exactly relevant to the course. Okay, so back to insurance. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with insurance, and I want to uh, give you three anecdotes, which I it's not a waste of time because it talks about the various elements of insurance and what you as a business person should do um, with respect to this particular matter. Um, uh, two of them are business-related, and then one is uh, a personal uh, matter, okay? So the first one I want to talk about is a situation where um, I had a student in my class, uh, Dave, who uh, became a client of mine and he had his own business entity. Well, Dave was married and had a child and his wife worked for the provincial government, the BC provincial government, and she had to travel. And so the government said, okay, um, here is an insurance company. If you want through your um, employee deductions to buy insurance, then uh, you can do it through this company. So she thinks, oh, okay, so she gets $100,000 in life insurance and uh, begins working. And she's working and working and working and working and working and uh, doing more traveling and her salary goes up. And so she thinks, well, I should, I should expand that. So she gets a second policy for another $100,000. And she's an excellent employee. So she gets a, uh, promoted to a manager, but she still has to travel. And so she thinks, well, now I'm making a substantial amount of money. I should get a third policy. So she gets a third policy and for $100,000. Uh, uh, and then uh, one time she's traveling and she's coming down the Fraser Highway when uh, a 18-wheeler uh, is coming up and goes over the line and bam, hits her car and she's killed instantly. Um, so I don't hear from Dave for about six months after the accident because, you know, he's uh, going through um, the grieving process and uh, he's trying to take care of the estate and trying to take care of his child. He comes into my office one day and he's, this this fellow does corporate security, okay? Um, not only, you know, securing your computer, but physical security. He's big, he's strong, um, and he came in and he it just... He looked like he'd been devastated, okay? And he said, uh, Peter, um, I don't know what to do with this. And he hands me a letter from the insurance company. I read the letter and it was about a one-liner. It said, we have reviewed the three policies and determined that we have no liability to pay out. Well, pardon me, but that insurance was designed for this exact situation. So I told Dave, never mind, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. And I wrote a letter to the insurance company, sent it on a Friday by email. On Monday, I get a response from them. And it says, 
we have re-reviewed the policies and we have now determined that we are liable to pay out. Over the weekend, they take six months to determine that they don't have to pay out. They don't provide any explanation. And then over the weekend, oh, hey, guess what we are supposed to pay out? Um, so, uh, and then two of them, they had to pay out immediately. And then the third, which is really irritating, um, we had to get um, letters probate, which means we have to make all sorts of documentation and we have to file it with the probate registry and then there'll be amendments and questions and everything. And it takes about six months to get probate. So now six months has gone by and it's going to be six months more before we get a, um, uh, a probate so that we can actually get those funds for Dave. And so I thought, well, okay, what happened here? So I called the woman on the that uh, sent me the letter, and I said, uh, just out of curiosity, um, what happened? And she said, what, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, you study the insurance policies for six months, and you determine you don't have to pay out. And on Friday, I send you the letter, and, hmm, oh, yeah, we do. Uh, and she, she was kind of irritated by this. And uh, she said, well, you know, we just, you know, made a mistake. And I said, oh, okay, um, another uh, curiosity question. The six months that you ha you were supposed to pay out on all three policies, totaling $300,000, who gets the interest on that money? My client? And she goes, well, no, we do. And I said, oh, well, um, we now have to wait another six months while we struggle for probate. Um, now, you know you have to pay out, but... Who gets the interest on that $100,000? And she goes, well, we do, and I don't like where you're going with this question. And I said, oh, I'll bet you don't, because it seems to me that the insurance company was delaying paying out because during that period of time, that money that they're going to have to pay to Dave has been invested and is earning income for them. Um, and she got extremely irritated that I was suggesting this, and I said, then provide me some other explanation. Um, and uh, she basically disconnected. Uh, so that irritated me. Now, if this was fly-by-night insurance um, or, um, you know, um, uh, if you've got a premium uh, or a policy, don't come to us, something like that, you know, some, some shady operation. But no, this is the one. This is a big insurance company in Canada, and it was the one recommended by the B.C. government, okay? And yet, this just didn't seem right. Now, it could have been just a mistake, okay? But I'm a little bit from Missouri on that, and that's an expression which means, you know, I don't always just believe the first thing you hear. Uh, okay, so that's one situation. All right, well, how often could that happen? Talk to Hans, my client from up north. Um, he had um, the lodge and he had some outbuildings and he has a hangar on his property. And then he had some cabins on lakes, three of them. And he would fly fishermen and hunters into those cabins. And they would stay there for up to a week at a time, taking in their food. Uh, they had no electricity, uh, no running water, so no toilets. They had to use an outhouse. Um, and uh, 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 But they had shelter, okay, and instead of staying in tents or whatever. Um, and so this one group goes in there. And uh, they're, they're elderly, and they're from Switzerland, and, and the head of the group is a really good friend of, of uh, Hans's. And Hans is flying in to pick them up, and there's the cabin in flames. What had happened was um, they had decided that they were going to burn some of the cardboard boxes that they had brought food in for. Now, they bagged up their garbage and, uh, you know, to take out, which was, they were told to do. Um, but they um, uh, they decided to burn the, the damp cardboard. And they kept putting in this little pot belly stove that was in the cabin and trying to light it and trying to light it and put more in, trying to light it. And all of a sudden, <laughs> up it goes with the cabin. So these four elderly people are running down to the lake and they're getting a little bucket of water and they're running up and going, Ugh, you, know, Ugh, you know, to no effect. Uh, Hans lands and he gets to the cabin and it's too late to do anything. It burns to the ground. The only fortunate thing is that it was cleared around the cabin and things were kind of damp at that time of the year and so there was no forest fire. Anyway, 
the head of the group, Hans's friend, says, look, Hans, I'm really sorry. This was just my stupidity. I'm going to write out a note explaining that it's all my fault. Give that to my insurance company and they'll pay for the cabin. Well, um, uh, Hans gets this you know, letter and he uh, sends it to the insurance company. And the insurance company sends back a letter saying, we are not liable to pay out. So Hans comes to me and he says, like, I don't understand. He, you know, he said. And so I said, well, let me, you know, write to the insurance company, which happened to be in Switzerland, of course, because they're from Switzerland. And I wrote to them and they said, well, um, my clients uh, speak uh, German and um, they had no instructions in English to uh, what to do in this situation. And, and so it's the business's fault. So I write back to them and tell them, no, they were given instructions going in. And those instructions are written in English, French, German, and um, uh, Japanese. Okay, because they get a lot of people from Japan. So um, <clears throat> they write back and they say, well, um, it, it's, it still wasn't clearly understood because it's, English is my client's second language. And I write back and I say, well, he gave us a written confession and the grammar in there is better than the grammar that most Canadians have, okay? They write back that we still don't think we should pay out because there was no fire extinguisher. So part of the risk management suggestion, um, I explained to my clients about these cabins that there should be a fire extinguisher and they might want to take a picture of the inside of the cabin. And so we send them a picture. There's the pot belly stove. There's the fire extinguisher, okay, that they... I don't know whether they tried to use it or not. But anyway, then the uh, Swiss insurance company writes back and he says, uh, they say, well, we still don't think we're liable to pay out. But this time they don't give any explanation at all. So Hans says, well, what do we do? And I said, well, okay, the next step is to ramp up and say we're going to sue them. Um, I found a Swiss firm and I contact them and I say, you do not do any work for this insurance company, do you? And they say, no. And I said, okay, I'm going to give you instructions. So I write to that law firm in Switzerland and I give them instructions to immediately commence a legal action against this insurance company. The insurance company calls me, I, I copied them, okay, by email, calls me the next day and say, oh no, hey, no, hey, oh, come on, no, no, we're going to pay out. Okay, so um, why do they do that? Well, because the longer they can delay paying out, the more interest they make on the money that they have invested, and then they can cover the costs of the insurance liability a lot easier. At least that's what I, the impression I'm getting. And um, it's worn out quite often because insurance companies even when they're sued, will delay and delay and delay the court action. Remember how I said it could take two to three years to get into uh, the B.C. Supreme Court? Well, the amounts of the insurance will make sure that you're pretty much in Supreme Court, not small claims, and they delay and delay and delay and delay and delay. And then as you're walking into the courthouse, they go, okay, let's uh, sit down and settle this, okay? So um, I think that there is a built-in uh, uh, sort of maybe not mentioned corporate policy that this is the case. Um, there, there was a, a movie in the United States uh, based on a, uh, a, a John Grissom book about um, insurance companies uh, with uh, um, people that had cancer and were going to die would delay and delay and delay and delay and delay because if the plaintiff dies, the case dies too. And so they, you know, it, but it was a fictional case. Um, and that's the United States. And so I was a little surprised that insurance companies could actually act almost like that in Canada. Um, so be cautious. Get more insurance than you need, but be ready for a fight. Now, my personal uh, case, the insurance company came through. Okay, so I have talked about the negative side. Now I'm going to be fair and talk about the positive side. But even in the positive side... There are a few pitfalls. Uh, my wife and I, when we adopted our two children, uh, decided that we were going to move from North Vancouver to the Sunshine Coast so that we had fresher air, 
um, a larger lot, um, you know, more room for the kids to run around, smaller uh, population, uh, that sort of thing. So we, we found this uh, place with a really nice size house. But my wife's going to run a bed and breakfast, so it has to be bigger. So we're actually adding on uh, another part of this house that is that will double it in size. And the construction is going really well. We had really good builders. Um, we get to the point... Now, now, we moved up, okay? So everything we had was stored in the bed and breakfast rooms on the one end, which and we're not operating yet. And then we're going to build the section that we're going to live in. And, and then we will move our furniture into that portion. And then the middle of the house is shared um, uh, lounge and, uh, and another bedroom for the B&B, right? Um, so the uh, end that we're going to live in is finished. Upstairs is master bedroom, living room, dining room, kitchen. Downstairs is the kids' room and then the three-car garage. Um, we're, it's almost done. And... Uh, uh, we, we it's summertime, the family's going to go on a on a, a camping trip. So we go off on the camping trip, and um, uh, I came back early, leaving the kids and my wife down there because we were going to put in an Allen block wall, and uh, we were doing this separately from the construction. And so I'm the cheap labor, and I get back and I'm late in the evening, and I'm sort of walking in, and the builders are just finishing off the work they were doing that day, and they said, "Oh, good, you're back, eh?" And I said, "Yes," and they said, "So I heard about the flood." I went, flood? No, what flood? And they go, oh, well, um, the really bad flood. Now, the master bedroom upstairs has an ensuite bathroom. And in there, the cold water line into the house, they attach it to the sink. And they're supposed to crimp the line. Um, but the uh, plumber forgot to crimp the line. So they turn on the water and... Okay, and then the water leaked into the space between the upper floor and the bottom floor for days and days and days, and nobody knew. So all of a sudden, the ceiling in the garage collapses. Now, what made this an absolute disaster was that we had taken all our belongings out of the bed and breakfast rooms and moved it into the garage so that it would be available to move upstairs easier and we could start fixing up the bed and breakfast rooms okay which was actually one nice room up top and a pottery student down below so we had lots of work to do there so we move our stuff in there whoosh, the ceiling collapses and everything that we pretty much uh had well not a lot of what we owned was just soaked and I go, I go in there at the end of the day, and I looked, and I went, oh, and oh, like, oh, oh, what a disaster. But it's quite late, so I think, well, there's nothing I can do. Uh, so I went upstairs, and eventually my uh, wife called me, um, and she said, uh, you know, what, what's going on? I told her, and she went, oh, my God, well, that's everything we own. Uh, get some towels from uh, the upstairs um uh, we're in the middle part where we were living at the time and go down and, and save stuff. So I went to bed that night. I get up the next morning and I walk into the garage and I've got some towels. Now you have to realize a three car garage is pretty much full of stuff, right? And I've got three towels. And so I walk over and there's one box and I thought, okay, I'll just move that. And I picked it up and the bottom fell out because it was full of water. And, and, and so I looked at the towels and I looked at this and I thought, <laughs> this isn't going to work. So I went upstairs and I called the insurance company uh, in Vancouver because we were living in North Van and we dealt with the company there. And they said, oh, no, no, Peter, don't worry about that. No, 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 no. You don't have to do any of that because um, what we do is we uh, get a flood restoration team and they whip in there and they'll just take care of everything for you. And I said, oh, that's covered in our insurance policy. And he goes, yes, 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 for sure. And I said, oh, okay, um, uh, and they said, now, you know, where are you located? And I said, oh, in Gibson's. And they went, oh, wow, mm, we don't know any uh, flood restoration teams up there. So you just go to the yellow pages um, and uh, select one and, uh, you know, give them um, our information and then get them in there to take care of your place. Now, I'm a very cautious person. Um, 
up until that moment, I had never really heard about flood restoration teams. Um, so uh, I thought, okay, no, I'm not going to choose one. Like, how do I choose? If I choose one and they're negligent, then it's my fault, not the insurance companies. So I ripped the page out of the yellow pages and I faxed it through to them and said, you choose. So they cho chose this flood restoration team. And boy, I tell you, they were like right there. You know, and they come in and they go, okay, no, don't worry about anything. We're going to take all the clothes and we'll send them to dry cleaners. We'll have them cleaned and dried and brought back. And all your books and, and papers and everything, we take those. We have drying rooms and we put them in the drying rooms. We have dryers and we uh, turn pages every day and, and we can dry them out and they will be as good as new. They didn't have any drying rooms um, and they didn't send the clothes to the dry cleaner. They forgot. They put them in big plastic bags, took them away, and stuck them in this guy's garage where they got mildewy and ruined. Um, and uh, and they they made, you know, lots of mistakes. Um, uh, they, they thought, okay, we're going to bring in a big container and put it in the driveway, and they'll put the dryers in there, and they can just put stuff in and dry them out. Sorry. And so this big truck comes up with this huge container on it and they're going to back down my new driveway and I ran out and I went no 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 don't don't and they go why I said because the driveway is you know new concrete and they said how long has it been down and I said um well it's been down only a week and they go oh no a week it's fine and they start backing down and I'm going no please don't no and I'm actually yelling at them and they get halfway down <laughs> big crack across my driveway so they pull out again and the guy from the flood restoration team looks at that and he goes oh man we're gonna have to get some cement patch on that and I looked at him and I said no and he goes what what do you mean and I said I had a brand new driveway I tell you not to back down it and you do anyway you're gonna cut out this section and you're gonna have it re-poured okay so they put the uh container down a we had two driveways and they put it down the other driveway which was you know 10 10 years old probably and it's fine um so they they start doing work and um i called my insurance company and i said uh, okay the flood restoration team guy has asked me for um the um deductible for my insurance policy i have a thousand dollar deductible and they said, yeah. And I said, well, wait a minute. No, no, no. It wasn't my fault. And they said, no, no, you pay him the deductible. And then eventually we'll deal with the uh, uh, plumber's insurance company and they'll compensate. Uh, they'll, they'll send the deductible they have to the flood restoration team and that guy will give you back your uh, uh, deposit. And I said, okay, so fine, I do that. Um, and uh, uh, then they, they start you know, taking care of everything. And they, then they, um, uh, oh, excuse me, I just uh, hear the phone going, so I'm going to make a phone. All right, sorry for that interruption. It was a telephone call from someone who said they were from Microsoft and they just wanted to get into my computer to check out a few things. <laughs> oh, sure, I let them. Um, anyway, uh, back to what I was talking about. Um, we have the, uh, you know, the flood restoration team in, and they started to repair the house. Okay, so they not only take care of the flood, but they, they rebuild, okay. Um, and an insurance adjuster from the company in Vancouver shows up, um, and um, we had a few battles with him. You have to remember the insurance adjuster is there to get your money as fast as possible. Um, yeah, maybe, but they work for the insurance company. They do not work for me. Okay, um, and so what happened was upstairs in the living room, dining room area, we had put down Brazilian hardwood flooring. And um, it had been badly warped um, along, uh, you know, pretty much throughout the whole house. And the um, uh, insurance adjuster brought in a hardwood expert um, and said, uh, so uh, what do we do here? And the hardwood expert says, well, we'll just sand down the whole floor and then we will uh, refinish it. And I said, no. And they looked at me and they said, what? And I said, I had a brand new Brazilian cherry hardwood floor 
that was really thick. They sand it down. I now have a floor half as thick. You know, why is that a concern? Well, if I have a thick floor, uh, 12 to 15 years, it will get scuffed and marked and split and cracked and stuff, and I will sand it down. And then I will have another 12 to 15 years of a nice flooring. But if they do it now, then it cuts the life of my floor in half. So I said, I wanted the floor that I had before. And so they said, okay, sure, fine, they'll do that. Now, around the counters in the kitchen, we had put down um, nice um, quartz tiles. And the hardwood floor butted up against it. And so um, the fellow goes in and he says, okay, well, what I can do is I can just take my saw and I can just right down there close to the uh, quartz uh, tiles, but not, uh, uh, or marble, not quartz, marble, and, uh, and not damage them. And I said, I don't think so. And he said, no, 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 watch. And he cracks the marble. So I said, well, you know, okay, got to re, re take that out and, and put in new marble too. Um, and the insurance adjuster was really, really adamant that we should do it the other way because it's going to be less expensive for the insurance company. They have to pay me less money. But no, they finally agreed. Sure, yeah, fine, they did it. Um, other things that occurred, um, we had, um, my wife had some long play records, those, you know, um, vinyl records and a, and a long play record player and some old music that she really uh, loved because she was in theater and she, you know, uh, has been a singer all her life. And um, they were destroyed. Why? Because they were in a box. And the flood restoration team took it and put it in their garage and then they piled some other stuff on top of it. So the vinyl records were like that. So we had to replace those. And I said to the insurance adjuster, okay, we'll just go and buy some CDs. And he said, no, 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 you won't. And I said, why? And he said, well, because, you know, CDs cost like 20 or $30 each. And those vinyl records, you can go to a used store and, and you can replace them for, you know, a dollar or, you know, 50 cents. And I said, um, we don't want the LPs because we want LPs. We wanted that music. So I said, I have to replace that music. And I said, I could probably go to 10 or 15 um, secondhand stores um, and not find that music. Okay. So I said, so what I'll do is I'll just, I'll go on Amazon and I'll find those LPs. So I found about five or six of them and I sent him the list and the cost of replacing those LPs and it was way in excess of the CDs and so he called me up and he said oh okay 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 Peter you can go buy your CDs um, so again you have to be you have to be on them now um, I had received one well two antiques from my father I had an antique um, Indiana Hickory rocking chair um, and that was okay because it was already upstairs in the other part of the, uh, the house but there was a, a an end table or you know uh, that goes beside your couch in your living room and it was damaged by the water so um, eventually uh, the the insurance adjusters kept saying give us a list give us a list of everything that's damaged you know we'll, we'll evaluate them and we'll get you money we'll get you money and um, we said uh, no we're not gonna rush okay and so um, <clears throat> you're allowed a year and we finally signed off 11 and a half months later. And this drove the insurance adjuster crazy because this file could not be closed. Um, but about 10 months later after the accident, um, the, uh, uh, the insurance, uh, I, my wife said to me, Peter, where's that antique end table? Because now, think, you know, we were moving things in and living upstairs and everything. Uh, and I went, Oh, I don't know. I, for, I forgot about it. So I called the flood restoration guy and I said, what happened to the end table? And he said, oh, um, it was damaged. So we sent it out to a, um, a woodworker that uh, repairs antique tables. And 
<laughs> I mean, that wasn't the answer, right? What happened to it? Um, and he said, oh, uh, sorry, they contacted us back and they said it was damaged too badly um, and uh, couldn't, could not be repaired, so it, uh, it was thrown out. Ah, okay, so here's the thing. You have one year on which to sign off on the insurance policy to get your money. If you miss that, you don't get anything, right? So um, they wanted us to sign off really quickly. You know, the faster you get that list done, the quicker we can get your money. And the problem with that is, of course, that you cannot remember everything that you had, you know, to do a list. You know, I challenge you, make a list of everything in your living room at home and see how many things you missed, right? So um, we waited as, as long as possible for that. Uh, so we had to, you have to watch them about that. Now, my sister... Uh, <clears throat> who lives in Victoria, or did until she passed away just a while ago, um, uh, they were robbed, and her jewelry was taken. And the insurance adjuster was right there, give me a list, and I'll get your money, and you can replace it, and everything will be fine. So she gives them a list, and she forgets about one specific ring. Okay, And she goes back to them after signing off, and said, oh, and I need to be compensated for that ring. Oh, Gosh, Maureen, oh, we're so sorry, but you signed off on the file, so we cannot compensate you for that, all right? So we waited that long before we signed off on the file. When we're about to sign off in the file, I said, what, what about our deductible that we gave to the flood restoration guy? So I called up the insurance company, and I said, what about that? And they said, oh, they had a forensic specialist come in, look at the crimping, of the line on the on the um, faucet under the bathroom sink, and uh, they had determined, in fact, that it had not been crimped, which meant it was just going to pop off. So it was the plumber's fault. I said, "Oh, great. Okay, so his deductible paid for it. Yes. So I should get mine back." And they said, "Yes." And they said, "Okay, well, send me a thousand dollars." They said, "No, no, you have to go to the flood restoration guy." I call up the flood restoration guy and I said, um, we have to have a check from you to replace the uh, deductible that we gave you. And he says, you didn't give me a deductible. And I said, oh, yes, we did. We gave you a thousand dollar deductible. And he said, I have no recollection of that. And I said, well, OK, I'm looking at my canceled checks and uh, gosh, there's one here payable to you. And he said, well, I, I didn't receive it. And I flipped it over and I said, well, look at the back of the, on, on the back of the check. It's got your business stamp and somebody's initials. And it looks like a, a, an account number, which must be yours. And he said, well, you drive to my office, bring that check and let me see it. I said, no way. This is your mistake. I've got proof. You drive here. And he reluctantly agreed. And I said, and when you come, bring your checkbook. Okay. So he comes in and he looks at the check. And he goes, well, I don't recall anything about that. As if, you know, you're perpetrating a fraud on us. Somehow you managed to get our business stamp on there. And somehow you managed to get my initials. And somehow you managed to get my account number on there. And somehow the $1,000 went into our bank, but you're perpetrating a fraud. I mean, that was the attitude, right? So I was really, really upset. I just, okay, you, know, you write out a $1,000 check and give it to me right now. So he did. Um, we signed off on the file and... Um, to the credit of the restoration team, when they did finish our house, or the, the portion, the, the, the new addition, um, they did a really good job, okay? Um, the point here is that you have to watch them every step of the way, and you have to keep meticulous records and, and, and make sure that you don't sign off too quickly until you've had an opportunity to think through... Um, you know, what you've lost. On that note, um, it is not a bad idea <clears throat> to, now that we have things like, gosh, these iPhones, is to walk around your house and take a video um, just in case something happens because then you will remember what was there and you can make a more thorough claim against your insurance policy. All right, 
Now, those are the three anecdotes that I wanted to talk about with my sisters thrown in as a good measured fourth. Now we're going to actually get into the meat of the chapter. And um, the first slide, which is slide 204, says what an insurance is. It's a method of shifting risk and spreading risk amongst a number of parties. Now, I could self-insure my house, which is worth a million dollars. So what that means is I would have to take a million dollars and put it into a bank account and leave it there in case something happened. Uh, mm, oh, I'm a little short. I don't have a million dollars in my pocket. So people cannot do that. So the idea of insurance is that you um, pay a small premium to the insurance company and they cover my house. How does that work? Well, they get a small premium from my neighbor over there. They get a small premium from my neighbor over there. They get a small premium from my neighbor over there. And suddenly they have a lot of money, <coughs> which they then invest to increase through interest, right? So they build up this huge amount of money. The thing to remember, though, is um, they, insurance companies are not benevolent institutions, okay? Um, they are there to maximize profits for their shareholders because they are not government agencies. There are some government insurance, like ICBC, but most in private insurance companies are there to make a profit. So they have this money, but they're still reluctant to pay out. Okay, But because they spread the risk amongst a lot of people, their idea is that it's very unlikely, and I'm going to touch wood, that any of these houses will burn down. One might way over there, and they'll have to pay to repair that. But because they've got money from everybody, they've got the money to do it, and hence insurance works. Okay, There are... Oops, there's a typo on that screen. It says four aspects of insurance when in actual fact I've listed five. Um, so I'm going to go in and repair that. So uh, when you see it, hopefully it will be correct. Um, five aspects of insurance. Okay, there's the nature of the risk covered. Is it a house? Is it a car? Is it a cottage? Is it a boat? Um, is it um, uh, a car that is just like, you know, a regular car like a Toyota or a Hyundai, or or is it a antique car? Um, because that will mean that you want to get uh, more insurance to re have a replacement value rather than the blue book value of a motor vehicle. So the nature of the risk covered. Um, the amount of the coverage. Uh, my house is um, worth, I don't know, approximately a million dollars. Um, so they uh <clears throat> now i i cannot say well it won't be completely damaged so i think i'll just get a thousand dollars no i have to get insurance to cover the thousand dollars and pay a premium accordingly okay so the amount of the coverage um uh, when i had a porsche um it was in uh, you know mint condition uh, you know something happened on it i would fix it something happened on it, i would fix it and um uh, i took it in one time to uh, lose bug spa down on Esplanade in North Vancouver, Lou's a big German fellow. He just, you know, pick up the car and work on it. <clears throat> anyway, um, he said, oh, Peter, do you have insurance? And I said, uh, well, yeah, I do. And he said, what kind? And I said, well, I, you know, ICBC. <coughs> and he said, um, oh, no, you want to get replacement value because they give me the blue book value because uh, the, the car was seven years old. So they think it depreciates in value. <clears throat> Pardon me. In fact, I maintain it, and because um, it's maintained, it actually goes up in value. So I actually have to, uh, I have a larger risk to cover. Okay, so that's important. So you figure out the nature of the risk, and then the amount of the coverage, okay, based on, on the value of the material, and then the term of the coverage. Well, we um, generally the insurance companies get insurance on a house for a year or car insurance for a year. But sometimes you can insure your car for six months because you're not going to be driving it for a period of time. So you look at the term of the coverage, and then you look at the premium to be paid. And you should shop around to numerous insurance companies, and we'll come back to that later, because you can get um, uh, $40,000 insurance for your Porsche and pay a premium of $100 with one firm and $120 for another firm and $300 for another firm. So you really have to shop around. And then there's the amount of the deductible. 
insurance companies don't want you to have um, a window break and um, uh, and make a claim and then have um, uh, you know your sink leak and some damage and make a claim and then so what they want to do is stop small claims and s small claims not small claims as in small claims court but s small amount claims and uh, and so they put in this deductible they have it on on cars okay you have a deductible for your windscreen because rocks are always hitting them right and so they say your deductible is a hundred dollars well usually you can you know get your windscreen um, repaired for less than that so they do do not want you to make a claim so that you're going to have to pay the hundred dollars yourself well you know are you going to go you know and hassle the insurance company no because of the deductible okay so those are the five things um, the the next slide is a, a cartoon um, and uh, I put that in there because it actually explains one of the concepts I've just been talking about and it shows a boss talking to one of his agents and he says you know don't make me tell you again that you know we're not here to pay out claims you know um, so just keep that in mind now we're going to use, get into some terminology and um, yeah, we'll talk about the background of these terms, um, and this would be good cannon fodder for uh, part A of the final exam. The first thing is the insurance policy. Uh, gosh, this is just written evidence of your insurance policy, but may not be the full policy in the sense that the agent may have made representations to you, which hopefully are in writing, um, and that may provide you somewhat more protection than actually is in the policy. Uh, we'll get to the Fines Flowers case uh, when we're talking about that. The premium is the price to be paid for the insurance policy. The deductible is the amount. Um, you know, on our house, uh, we have, uh, gosh, I don't even know what the deductible is um, because uh, my business manager wife takes care of that. But our deductible will be, you know, $1,000 or something to stop small claims. The insured is the person taking out the claim, okay? And the insurer is the company that provides the insurance policy. Well, um, uh, then what's a beneficiary? Okay, so on my house, um, uh, my wife and I are now both on title because I retired from the practice of law. We are the insured. If, the, if there's some damage to the house, we get the insurance. Um, but if I had life insurance, um, I, I don't want the, the money, okay? Because if I die, um, I have been told I cannot take it with me um, and so I want it to go to my children now if it turns out that um, after I die I find out I could have taken all that money with me and had a really good time I'm gonna be upset okay ha 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 that's a joke um, but right now um, it goes to my wife if uh, she's still alive and if we are both uh, if she predeceases me then the insurance will go to my beneficiaries which are my children okay Okay, the insurance agent is the person that works for the insurance company that you deal with when you get your policy. A little bit of a caution here. The insurance agent works for the insurance company, not for you. Okay, and what that means is if I went to Bob, my insurance com uh, agent, um, I should remember that he's not actually my insurance agent. He's the person that represents the company that I'm dealing with. Now, I want to impress the heck out of Bob. So I walk in, I sit down, and I go, Bob, um, I want the uh, an insurance policy with the widest coverage possible, the lowest premium, and the lowest deductible. <laughs> well, everybody wants that, right? So all that Bob knows is that I don't know much about insurance. So he gives me the best policy, the widest coverage, the lowest premium, and the lowest deductible. He did exactly what I want, right? And then I'm talking to Duncan, my neighbor over here. And I say, hey, Duncan, look at this policy I got. And Duncan looks at me and he says, wow. He says, I got wire coverage, a lower premium, and our deductible's the same. I think, you're kidding. I don't know. So I call Bob back. And I hey, Bob, I just talked to Duncan, and he's got a way better policy than I do. Bob says, well, yeah, Peter, but, uh, you know, I gave you the best policy our company has. That's a different company. So suddenly I realized, oh, I should have shopped around, right? Um, I, I can't sue him because he did exactly what I said. He gave me the best policy. Um, 
they have, okay? Now, when you're dealing with private insurance, uh, Bob probably works for me, okay? Because Bob may be an independent agent, right? So he doesn't work for one company. He's more like a broker, an insurance broker. I'll go in and I'll say best policy, widest coverage, lowest premium, lowest deductible. And he'll go around to numerous companies and they'll come back with some suggestions. Now, if you could compare them easily, then the companies that charge too much would be out of business. But you can't because they vary the, the contents and the premiums and the deductibles and everything. So that it's, it's kind of hard, but you make the best possible choice. For business, however, Bob will work for the insurance company only. And um, that's when you want to have an insurance broker unless you can feel comfortable about doing it yourself. And the idea is an insurance broker does not work for a company. He will go out or she will go out and find the best policy that possible and, and give you the recommendations. Okay, private uh, insurance uh, agents are generally agents brokers. When you get into business, because it's a little more serious, the risks associated with it, um, the brokers uh, will um, uh, look at your business specifically and give you advice. Now, if you're using an insurance broker, the first thing you say is, um, who pays you? Okay, Because there's a lot of brokers who will get paid by the insurance company that they place the policy with. Um, whereas some um, will say, um, I'm doing this for you, so you have to pay me, and then you want to know how much. Okay. Now, the insurance adjuster, the definition is, the official definition is a person who is an expert in appraising property losses, and I put in brackets, and whose job it is to pay out the minimum amount possible, end of brackets. Okay. The insurance adjuster never works for you, never works for you, and oh, by the way, did I say never works for you? Um, and I've got another anecdote um, uh, on this. Um, years ago, I had a sailboat moored in Mosquito Creek Marina because I lived in North Vancouver, and somebody else's boat uh, broke my engine mount. Um, my engine did not fall into the water because I had a chain around it to keep it from being stolen. Um, but it was hanging off the back of my sailboat, which was a 27-foot Tanzer, okay? And uh, the, the, that boat that broke off my engine mount went away, okay? Um, so I called my uh, insurance company, and they said they'd have an insurance agent or um, adjuster down there. And, I mean, he was down there so fast, it was like I hang up the phone, I turn around, well, there he is, right? And he goes, hey, Peter, right here, I'm here to help you. And he goes down to his, the boat, and he, and he literally jumps on it, and he runs to the stern, which for you land lovers is the blunt, flat back end, whereas the bow is the pointy part at the front. Um, and anyway, he looks over and he goes, okay, broke the engine mount. Um, it's probably uh, $50 for a new one. Uh, the engine didn't go in the water. Uh, $25 to install the engine mount. Uh, so you're looking at a $75 cost here. Your deductible is $100. So you don't want to make a claim. And he hops off the boat and he says, bye, Peter. And I went, whoa. And he goes, what? And I said, I've never touched anything on my sailboat that didn't cost me over $100. Um, uh, a sailboat is often referred to as a hole in the water that you throw money into, okay, because they're so expensive to uh, maintain. And he tried to talk me out of making a claim, but I said, well, I want the engine um, overhauled. And he said, why? It didn't go in the water. And I felt like saying, have you heard of waves? You know, so it's hanging off the back of the boat. It doesn't mean that a wave hasn't gotten salt water into the engine, right? And I said, I don't want to be up in Desolation Sound in a storm. Desolation Sound is a beautiful place to sail unless there's a storm. And then it really lives up to its name, Desolation Sound. I don't want to be up there, you know, with my engine. Okay. So um, he said, well, okay, Peter, you know, but you know what's going to happen. Listen to this carefully. He says, you'll make a claim and it'll be $100 and you're going to wind up, uh, you know, paying for it anyway. And next year, because you've had an accident, your premium will go up. And I said, no, I didn't have an accident. Everybody agreed that somebody else hit my boat. Well, yeah, but you've had a claim and so your premium will go up. I thought, well, how fair is that, right? 
anyway, um, long story longer, um, he goes away. Um, I made a claim, and after the engine mount was put on, because there was some cracks in the gel coat, um, and after the uh, engine was overhauled, um, it uh, turned out to be $680, okay, which isn't much. But what that meant was I paid 100 my deductible, and the insurance company paid the other 580 Not only that, but I feel a little more comfortable when I was using it. Okay, I've now sold my sailboat, but um, <clears throat> that's another story entirely. So the insurance adjuster does not work for you. They will try like they did with my house to get a quick claim or like my sister get a you know quick claim signed off um, and bingo they've done their job and uh, you find out that you're um, a little worse off than you thought. Okay so we now get into riders and endorsements and these are both absolutely important. Absolutely important, absolutely important. Why? Because two reasons. One is they will be on the exam and um, they're really important in life, all right? So a rider, what's a rider? It's a document attached to the front of the insurance policy evidencing the fact that you've paid an additional premium for wider coverage. I'll give you an example. When I lived in North Vancouver, I was in a four unit townhouse complex. Okay, there was unit A with Bob, an accountant. Unit B, that's Peter the lawyer. Unit C was an engineer. Um, uh, and then unit D was a um, uh, secretary, okay. Uh, the wife is a secretary, the husband was an architect. So it's sort of a professional building. <laughs> Never thought about that. Anyway, um, uh, the other three couples um, were older than Kathleen and I. And you're looking at me and you're saying, oh my God, how much older must they have been? Um, this was 14 years ago. Um, anyway, um, they wanted earthquake insurance. Now, I happen to know that, that the building which I saw being built was extremely well built. Um, I was out front on the street watching them build it one day when this fellow walks by and we started talking and he said, you know, he said, that place is built like a fortress. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, the lumber that's going in there the beams are all, you know, bigger and, you know, stronger. And the foundation is, you know, like so fantastic. The builder is just incredible. And I said, well, how, how do you know so much about it? It was Dick from Dick's Lumber in North Vancouver, right? So he really knew what he was talking about. So I felt good about buying the building. The other thing is, if you look at the history of earthquakes, you know, we've had a few. Um, but they've been pretty minor. And so if you get insurance for earthquake coverage... Uh, number one is it's very unlikely, thank goodness, that an uh, earthquake would occur. And number two, if one did occur, it's very unlikely to be serious enough to do damage. And number three, if it did damage, um, it would have to be a horrendous in uh, earthquake in order to cause sufficient damage to pay for the deductible. The de deductible was $10,000 per unit. So there's a $40,000 deductible before you can actually start getting the insurance company to pay anything. Not only that, the premium is very high, okay? But we voted because we have a strata corporation. Three vote for insurance, we vote against it. Bingo, we get insurance for earthquake coverage. So Bob, the accountant, goes out and he arranges it and the policy came to him and, and my wife and I were walking into our complex one day and Bob is out there and he goes, hey, Peter, um, you know, here's the insurance policy, you're a lawyer, maybe you should read it, okay? Um, okay, so I, the last thing I ever intended to do in the whole world was read an insurance policy. Um, I, I can't think of anything worse than that than either reading the former textbook that we used to have which was terrible if you could not sleep read a bit and you'd fall asleep and number two um, having a root canal okay so um, i did not intend to read the policy my wife and i walk into the house i open the door i put the policy in, and i close the door and my wife says you are going to read that and i went oh yeah <laughs> you bet never intending to read it okay so, you know, some time goes by and um, my wife um, doesn't sleep very well. She's a type A personality, uh, you know, worries about um, things. 
and if she doesn't have anything to worry about, then she worries about the fact that she doesn't have anything to worry about. Uh, so she was, she's always up early. But one morning I woke up a little earlier than usual and I come downstairs to the living room, the fireplace is on, she's sitting on the couch. And she says, oh, you know, sweetie, why don't you get on this couch over here? And, she, you know, I go, okay, and, and I lean back and she puts a pillow behind me and she says, I'll go get you a cup of coffee. And I'm thinking, wow, this, you know, married life is pretty good. She goes into the kitchen and she comes back, you're guessing this, right? She comes back with a cup of coffee and with the policy. She says, as long as you're up early, um, why don't you read the policy? Now I know when I'm gone, okay? So um, I'm sitting there and I've had eight hours sleep. I'm drinking coffee and I'm reading this policy and I'm still almost falling asleep, okay? They're boring documents. Um, anyway, the first thing I did was look at the front uh, and there was a writer, okay? Um, well, no, actually, I was reading through it, and I got to the earthquake section, and I said, um, and it says, um, if there is a rider attached to the front of this policy evidencing payment of an additional premium for earthquake coverage, this uh, policy covers earthquake with the exception of the following. Okay. And so the first thing I did was flip to the front. There's the, the uh, rider, and there's the uh, earthquake insurance, yeah, yeah, and there's the premium evidencing that we've paid for it. Okay. So the clause in the insurance policy covers earthquake. And then I go back and I start reading that section. Covers earth, damage caused by earthquake with the exception of. Now, these adjusters must stay up pretty late at night, um, you know, laughing and putting those in um, because, you know, only they could think it up. The first one was um, covers damage caused by earthquake except for... Um, what was it? Uh, damn, oh, except for a nuclear war. Okay. So, you know, <laughs> we're having an earthquake, and because we're having this earthquake, we think they shot at us, and so we shoot at them, and there's an earth, and there's a nuclear war. Um, so I guess they would be North Korea? I don't know. But anyway, um, <clears throat> you know, when I look at that and I go, okay, well... <laughs> Pardon me, but if there is a nuclear war, uh, Ground Zero is Surrey, uh, the hydrogen bomb will be exploded there, and everything out to Vancouver Island will be almost instantly vaporized. So am I going to be worried about my house? Uh, uh, hey, insurance company, um, this uh, glowing uh, blob here used to be my house. Could you please fix it? No, I don't think so. Right. And the second exception was... Um, uh, armed insurrection uh, and, and, you know, uh, caused by uh, the earthquake. So there's a, and everybody goes, hey, let's go over to Victoria and kick the government out. <laughs> like, okay, I mean, I guess, I guess it's possible, but are they going to mass in North Vancouver and go to Victoria through my house? Okay. Then the third one was riots. Well, that's a concern because we saw a, um, an earthquake in uh, uh, Los Angeles, and everyone, hey, oh, earthquake, and they all ran out and broke into stores and stole TVs and things. Not everybody, but some people did. <clears throat> well, okay, let's say that happens in North Vancouver. Um, there's riots. Are they going to break into my house and steal my used TV? No, they're going to break into London Drugs on Lonsdale, steal the TV there, and get the warranty. <laughs> I'm just kidding about the warranty. But, you know, so, you know, I'm going, you know, okay, nuclear war, no, armed insurrection, no, riots, no. Um, and then one that got to me that worries me is, um, except damage caused by secondary aftershock. Now, usually when there's an earthquake, a few minutes later, there's, and then a few minutes later, there's, and then, Okay. And what that means is the Teutonic plagues buckled and you had the earthquake and then they settle back and you get these secondary quakes, right? Well, how are they going to know what the damage was on secondary aftershock, right? So there's the earthquake and the insurance agent's in my, in my living room and he goes, or the adjuster, and he goes, okay, there's that big crack right there. That's the damage caused by the earthquake. Wait, Wait, wait. All right, that damage is secondary aftershock. There's no way. 
So what they're going to say was, oh, okay, it was a 6.9 earthquake, and then the secondary aftershock was uh, 4.2. So um, we figure that probably $80,000 worth of damage was caused by secondary aftershock. All it is, is their way of paying out less than they would otherwise have to. So you've already paid a huge premium. There's already a huge deductible, and they're going to deduct some more from what they give you because of secondary aftershock. Simple as that, okay? They're not benevolent institutions. Then I get to the next one. So the policy says, <clears throat> this policy covers damage caused by earthquake with the exception of damage caused by earthquake. Damage caused by earthquake, except damage caused by earthquake. So I went back and I read it about three or four times looking for grammatical construction, uh, commas, semicolons, trying to figure out, like, what was that? Like, how did... Finally, I thought, I give up. And I phoned Bob, my insurance agent, which, you know, he's a nice guy, but um, he's, you know, his voice drives me crazy, right? So I phoned Bob and I go, hi, Bob, it's Peter Holden. I've got a problem with my insurance policy. Well, Peter! You know, these insurance policies are complex contractual documents, and I'm not surprised there might be something that you don't understand. What clause is it? So I read it to him. Bob, are you still there? I'll go back to you. And he hung up. Okay. Comes back to me later, and he says, Oh, Peter, that's a typographical error, and we're going to send you, and I said, an endorsement. The next item on my list a document attached to the front of the insurance policy evidencing uh, an amendment to the policy so that they don't have to retype the whole thing, okay? And he goes, oh, how do you know about that? And I said, well, I'm a lawyer and I, you know, cover this in my uh, uh, business law class. Oh, okay. So I said, Bob, just out of curiosity, this is a standard form policy that you send out to all your customers, right? And he goes, right. I said, so how many... Of these policies are probably out there. He says, oh, probably thousands. <laughs> okay, scenario. Huge earthquake on the North Shore, okay? Let's say they've got a thousand policies on properties worth a million to five million dollars. And there's substantial damage. And they're, they're going to be paying out half a billion dollars. Um, are they going to pay out? Oh, wait a minute. No, the policy says uh, it covers uh, earthquake except damage caused by earthquake, so we don't have to pay out. Okay. Um, now, I think it was just a mistake. Oh, I hope it's just a mistake. Anyway, um, uh, you know, so they sent me an endorsement, and, you know, then I'm, I'm protected. Uh, now, you, you're trying to decide whether you believe me. Let me add uh, a, another... Um, factor to this. This this was when I was living in North Vancouver. Um, so you're talking probably 18 years ago. Okay. A couple of years ago, I'm explaining this to my class. One of my students goes home and they ask, Dad, can I see our insurance policy? And they read through and he came to class the next day and he said, Peter, that clause is still in the contract. <laughs> You know, so um, what would happen, of course, is that they would say, oh, yeah, damage caused by everything. We're not liable to pay out. And then you say, OK, that's it. I'm suing you. Three to five years later, you're finally getting into court. You're walking up the courthouse steps. The judge is not going to let them get away with that. OK, they are going to have to pay. But they will pay then rather than go to court. Right. Because then they'd have to pay party and party costs as well or probably a barrister and solicitor client costs, which is the maximum amount you can get compensated from the uh, defendant. They'll settle, but that means they've held on to a half a billion dollars for three to five years. Um, they don't get the same amount of interest on their investments we do. They get higher interest, okay? So that would be a substantial amount of more money that they would have to pay out the claims. So I think they would delay, okay? Um, that is me up on my soapbox. I have no proof of that except from my experience of how they do delay paying out. So a rider, paper at, attached to the front of the policy, evidencing payment of an additional premium for further coverage. 
uh, an endorsement when they want to change the policy um, to uh, make an amendment. Uh, our, our endorsement <clears throat> for our townhouse complex had a clause in there that said um, uh, we don't pay for mold in, uh, in, the, in the walls from uh, poor construction. All across North Vancouver there were thousands of uh, condos where they didn't put up the proper um, uh, barrier, um, water barrier, moisture barrier. And <clears throat> there was lots of mold forming between the outside stucco and the wood and causing you know, problems for respiratory uh, infections and things. And <clears throat> people, you know, thousands and thousands of people were making claims. <clears throat> they don't want that, <laughs> good Lord. They don't want to pay out money. So um, they paid those claims, of course. But then every policy after that that they started issuing, they said, hey, we don't pay for that anymore. Okay. Um, and the other thing is, uh, the insurance companies, because they're so big, they're international, um, there was that um, uh, earthquake in L.A. Um, our premium in Vancouver goes up because of an earthquake in L.A. Um, why? Has our risk gone up? No. The risk is the same. But, hey, they had to pay out a lot there, so they're going to cover it by uh, increasing your premiums. Okay, personal insurance, insurance against death, injury, and ill health. Um, I had that kind of insurance through the university. Uh, property insurance uh, is insurance against uh, damage to your property, and that had private <coughs> insurance. The uh, policy that I got through the university is called um, <coughs> term insurance, and we don't get into that. But what it is is while I work here, um, I was covered up to age 65, and then and then I had no longer have insurance. Okay, that's term insurance. After a term, it expires, no insurance. Um, so while I was working, you know, before I was 65, um, every once in a while, my wife would call me and I'd go, uh, hi, uh, sweetheart, I'm right in the middle of uh, teaching. And she said, yeah, I'm just wanting to see how you are. And I said, well, I'm fine. She'd go, oh, <laughs> because it was a double indemnity policy. If I dropped in the classroom, she would get double. <laughs> I'm only kidding. She didn't do that. But I had uh, $350,000 worth of uh, life insurance through the university. Uh, if anything happened to me, it didn't cover my wife. Um, but if um, I died on the job, they paid double indemnity, and that would be $700,000, right? Um, all right. Uh, so the insurable, uh, sorry, insurance binder. What is an insurance binder? Um, I should put something in there, but um, let me explain it. Um, in the lecture materials, which you should have bought at the bookstore, um, and it was printed before COVID-19, so you should be safe, okay? Um, there is an index, and you go to the index, and you look down at the list of uh, things in there, and one of them is a, um, uh, gosh, I hope it's there, uh, yeah, binder of insurance on page 15, and you go to page 15, oops, went by it. Uh, sorry, I went too far. <coughs> Looks like this, all right? Now, another anecdote with respect to that. <clears throat> My uh, client up north, he and his wife live down here during the winter, and uh, they run their lodge in the summer. Um, well, actually, they run it all year long now, but they have somebody manage it during the winter. So they live down here in the winter, and they bought a house in North Vancouver, and I did the purchase for them. Um, and one of the things I said was, okay, we're I'm putting all the documents together. Now, we have to get insurance on the house because if we buy the house on uh, May the, what's today, 4th, um, and we get the insurance on May the 5th, but it burns down on the 4th, you get nothing, okay? So we have to have the insurance in place before I complete the transaction. And uh, they said, oh, man, we're, we're at the airport. We're just leaving. We're going to Switzerland. We don't have time. And they said, can you... Uh, actually, let me back up. I said, you know, should I get the insurance or should you? And they said, oh, no, they had an insurance agent, and they would get it. They forgot. Because I am this sort of nervous lawyer... Um, just before the transaction was to complete, I called them and I said, do you have the insurance? And they went, oh, God, we forgot. And they're just about to get on a plane to go to Switzerland. So they said, call Barton's Insurance Brokers, okay, and um, they'll arrange it. And I said, what about the premium? They said, they trust them. They'll be fair. So I called Barton's Insurance. Now, I, I'm not saying they're good. I'm not saying they're bad. I don't know them, okay? This is just an example. 
<clears throat> and I said, um, I was a lawyer. I'm completing this transaction. It closes tomorrow. I need insurance, a confirmation of insurance that's in place today. And the agent says, you got it. That's true. I've asked for it. I've got it. Problem with that is it's a verbal contract. Okay. And um, let's change the scenario a little bit. So I say, okay, uh, great. And now, you know, uncomfortable. We got the insurance. He's a really good employee and um, he's very dedicated. So he puts the paperwork in his, in his briefcase because he didn't have time during the day. He's going to work on it over the weekend. Okay. He's driving over the Burrard Street Bridge and he takes a hard right. There's no hard right splash okay so for some reason he drives out the road and he goes in the water and he passes away the car gets taken to the impound and um, the wife goes down <laughs> and views the body um, and then she goes home and uh, uh, nobody looks in the trunk of that car and went oh wait there's a briefcase here oh wait there's some papers in here that must be important right so suddenly the insurance papers have not been completed and nobody knows except Bob that um, there was insurance in place. So a loss occurs. <clears throat> Hans calls the insurance company and says, hello, may I please speak to Bob? And they say, oh, sorry, Bob is no longer with us. And Hans says, oh, well, where did he go? And the insurance company says, we're not sure. Um, you have insurance, but you cannot prove it. So when I was talking to the insurance agent, broker, the day before the transaction, I said, I need that confirmation. And they said, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get that to you uh, Monday or Tuesday. And I said, no, <clears throat> it's closing tomorrow, Friday. Um, I need proof now. And they said, well, we're really busy. And I said, well, okay, then I'll call someone else because they can do a binder of insurance, that document. And it says... Binder number two, dear sir, <clears throat> please be advised that uh, this is insured. Uh, the dwelling in North Vancouver back in uh, 1996 was worth $140,000. Okay, now it's you know, a million and a half. Uh, anyway, so they had coverage in place, um, they did it for um, one year, and um, it says premium to be announced. Um, well, what they're saying is, yeah, you've got the insurance guaranteed to that amount. <clears throat> we don't know what the actual premium is going to be. We'll tell you later. Hans said he trusted them that they, you know, they would be fair. And as far as I know, they were. Okay. And this is loss payable. Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. Well, why, <laughs> why is the bank on there? Because my clients bought the house, but they needed a mortgage. They get a mortgage through CIBC. Um, if the house burns down, does Hans get all the money? No, he gets some of the money. Okay. Um, and then the amount that's owed to the bank goes to the bank and the mortgage is paid off. Then if Hans wants to rebuild, he goes back to the CIBC and they give him a new mortgage. Okay. But it's to protect the CIBC. Hans doesn't get the money and leave. Okay. And the bank's holding a mortgage on a house that's been destroyed. Uh, remember back to when we were talking about the contract assignment and I said the eight things that you could do in order to uh, uh, make sure that uh, you're protected uh, for payment of the, um, of the amount of the contract. And one of those was get the insurance. Um, so you tell you're, you're giving product or equipment to somebody and you say, OK, you're getting the use of the, the equipment. We want you to get insurance on that. So they do. And they forget to pay the premium or they cancel the policy because they're running out of money and there's damage and you go, okay, you know, pay me through your insurance. And they go, oh, we don't have any. So what you do is you say, okay, you get the insurance. I'm not going to get the insurance because you're using the assets. Okay. You get the insurance on the asset and make me a loss payee for the amount of money that you owe me. <clears throat> okay. So that uh, finishes off the insurance binder and um, I think I've uh, just been uh, notified that breakfast is um, uh, starting to <laughs> be asked for, and I'm the uh, chef this morning. All right, lots of interruptions, but we will get through this. Um, I have made breakfast, um, sort of a pan-scrambled eggs with uh, mushrooms, onions, 
green peppers, ham, and um, uh, then cheese melted on at the last minute. Toast. It was very good. Um, and now I'm full, so we can get back at it. Hopefully there will be fewer interruptions. Um, I was talking about insurance binders uh, when I stopped, and I didn't quite finish the idea. So you get the business uh, that you uh, uh, want to get insurance on your on your goods, and you say, okay, make me a lost payee. Just like CIBC said, okay, you're getting a margin in a house, make us lost payee. What does that do? Well, let's say the business is struggling and they want to cancel their policy or they want to cash it in or something and get money. Um, if they go to the insurance uh, company and they say cash in this policy, the insurance company will say, well, wait, there's a lost payee on there um, and we'd better contact them and find out if they're okay with that. So you are protected. Uh, the next two concepts, fiduciary uh, relationship and uh, insurable interest, um, are important. Um, uh, are important. Um, uh, are important. Did I say they're important? They are important for two things. Again, real life and examination purposes. A fiduciary relationship comes up in uh, corporate law. We saw it in Section 142, duties of the directors. They have a fiduciary relationship of good faith and trust. Um, it comes up in all sorts of uh, situations. It comes up in insurance too. And <clears throat> interestingly enough, you would think that a fiduciary relationship, which is a relationship of the utmost good faith, requiring the parties to act fairly with integrity with each other, uh, making full disclosure, it would sound like the insurance company who is an expert in insurance should have the fiduciary duty towards you. Um, in fact, it goes both ways. And... Um, the fiduciary relationship that you owe to the insurance company is to keep them apprised of all activities which might affect the risk to the uh, insured assets, okay? Um, so when I um, got my sailboat repaired, the um, uh, engine mount and the engine, um, I was dissatisfied with that particular insurance company and uh, I'm almost embarrassed to say uh, how I got them. When I became a partner with uh, Mackay, Turlock and Holden, Bob Mackay had a boat and he recommended that company. So rather than do the investigation myself, um, I just uh, went with his recommendation. So anyway, um, I had this claim and the adjuster made it very clear that my premium was going to go up next year. So when I was talking to Bob, my insurance agent for my personal house and assets, I said, hey, Bob, um, do you know anyone who does marine insurance? Because I've got a, a sailboat and I'd like to uh, maybe change uh, insurance companies. And Bob went, oh, you don't want to use us? And I said, oh, I'm sorry, Bob, I didn't know you did marine insurance. I mean, he sounded like a hurt puppy. Uh, anyway, I asked him for a quote and... I didn't tell him about the claim last year because I didn't want my premium to go up. Eh, wrong. Um, I, because I'm a lawyer and I'm honest, um, the first thing out of my mouth was, okay, I had a claim and I explained that it wasn't my fault, but I had this claim and, uh, and he said, oh, you know, well, okay, that, uh, thanks for letting us know. We'll put it on the file, but that won't affect your uh, application with us. And he came back and he gave me wider coverage, okay, um, and a lower premium with the same deductible. Um, so uh, how can I have wider coverage? I mean, you cover the boat. No, you cover the boat, but they say, okay, you can only sail within certain boundaries. Okay, they don't want to give you insurance on your sailboat and then you try to cross the Pacific, right? So um, before I could sail up to Desolation Sound and down to the U.S. border. Under the wider coverage, I could sail to the top of Vancouver Island and all the way down to the end of Puget Sound in Washington State, okay? So I had wider coverage and my premium was lower even though there was a claim because they acknowledged that the, the accident that occurred was not my fault. Had I not told them and had I had a claim, um, they would find out about the previous claim. Insurance companies talk to each other, believe me. Um, and they would have denied giving me any co any uh, insurance because I had 
breached my fiduciary duty with them. <clears throat> okay, so that's the um, ins uh, fiduciary duty. Um, the insurance company owes it to you and you owe it to the insurance company. Um, and then we get into the concept of insurable interest. And I make refer reference to the Cosmopolis versus the Constitution Insurance Company. Cosmopolis owned a building. And as your accountant recommends, you uh, depreciate the cost of the building very quickly. Well, <clears throat> the building is depreciated to zero, which means on your books it says the building is valued at zero. But the building is still there. It's well maintained. It's, you know, it's worth a lot. So the accountant says, look, why don't you form a corporation of which you are the sole shareholder, sole director, sole officer, and sell your building to that corporation, and then that corporation can start reducing the uh, uh, taxable income by depreciating it again. And Cosmopolis said, well, I, you know, that's fine and dandy, but I, I could form a company, but I don't have the money to buy my building, okay? And uh, and the insurance uh, the accountant said no 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 you don't you don't do that you 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 know you buy it over time okay so you buy it over twenty five years you know so much per year and you put in an interest rate and you know it's all tax deductible and blah 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 the smoke and mirrors that they always do so Cosmopolis says uh, okay so he goes to his uh, lawyer and they incorporate a company and it goes through the process of buying the building from him. Uh, and then the building burns down. Well, they incorporated the company and they purchased the building correctly, but the insurance on the building was held by Mr. Cosmopolis. The building is owned by the corporation. The corporation is a separate legal entity from Mr. Cosmopolis. So when Mr. Cosmopolis claimed on his insurance policy, the insurance company said, you don't own the building. You have no insurable interest in that building to be protected, so you do not get any money. Now, it was um, appealed through the courts all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, and the Supreme Court of Canada is your last appeal, right? So they can sometimes do things which aren't technically correct. And so what they did was they acknowledged that a corporation is a separate legal entity from its owners, usually. But in this particular situation, because Mr. Cosmopolis had paid the premiums all along until the disaster occurred, um, that he should somehow receive the insurance. And so what they did was they said, in this particular instance, the... Um, uh, it is tantamount to him owning the building because he was the sole shareholder, director, and officer. Okay, um, technically uh, wrong, but like, how do you appeal? There's no higher court, right? Um, I think that, and and they were very careful to say it's a situation where there is one shareholder, the person who owns the policy. What happens if when he formed the corporation? He put his uh, brother-in-law on there as a shareholder, director, and officer, and he put on a friend of his, and they were going to run it together or something. They would have been out of luck, okay? So you have to have an insurable interest in the subject matter of the policy. Uh, the uh, last term that we're going to deal with right here is subrogation, and I'll just read it. When a negligent party causes a loss with the insurer... Um, Oh, and the insurer compensates the insured, the insurer is subrogated to the rights of the insured and may sue the negligent party. What? What's that mean? Well, I'm driving along, somebody hits me, the insurance company pays for my car, it turns out that the car that hit me was driven by someone from out of province and has an insurance company with another province, right? Um, and so the, my insurance company pays me, what I'm supposed to do is I'm supposed to sue the negligent driver that hit me, win the court case, get the money, and then pay it back to the insurance company. Oh yeah, like I'm going to do that, right? So they have developed this con concept of subrogation where the insurance company is subrogated to my right to sue. So what the insurance company does is they sue the out-of-province driver in my name. They do the whole lawsuit. I may be called as a witness if necessary. 
uh, usually these things are settled. Um, and that's how the insurance company gets compensated for the loss uh, that was caused by someone from outside the province. If we're both insured by ICBC, then they're not going to go through the whole insurance thing because uh, it's all the same pot of money. But if it's a, a driver from outside, subrogation works that way. Subrogation works in all insurance situations, not only vehicles. Now, changing gears, um, we have talked about insurance generally. Now we're going to get into the business aspects of it. So you start a business and you have to get insurance. You can feel comfortable and do it yourself or you can do it through a broker, uh, but whatever way, you're gonna to have to decide what insurance your business needs. And you go like, what do you mean? I mean, I get insurance, but there's different types, okay, for different risks. And the insurance companies have separated them all out and they make you pay premiums you choose this one, this one, this one, this one, you pay premiums. Just the way it works. So it, there's two types. There is insurance on business assets, and then there's insurance on business operations. We're going to separate them. If you go in and you get a policy on assets, they will give you the standard policy, and then you choose optional extras, okay? So the... Um, Standard policy you get is on slide 210, and it says insurance on business assets, number one, fire, flood, and damage from natural elements. Okay, good. Then um, uh, the standard policy on operations um, is on slide 211 under the capital B, and it says um, the standard policy is number nine, public liability and property damage insurance. So if you go in and you say, give me your standard policy for my business, you get property damage uh, and public liability, and you get fire flood <clears throat> damage from natural elements. Then you have to pick those other risks that are related to your business. Um, and if you don't, then I'll, I'll give you another anecdote uh, which shows how that can cause you a problem. So going back to slide 210, we're looking at insurance on business assets, right? Fire, flood, and damage is from natural elements. It's the standard policy. That's what you get. Then you look at your business. And if you have a plate glass window, uh, those can cost, oh, I don't know, five to $8,000 to replace. <coughs> I had a client who had um, an oriental furniture store on Hastings. In the picture window, um, he had a ornately carved jade coffee table. When my client made it out of China with his family and some assets, when Mao took over, um, the, the jade coffee table was one of the things he got out. It was not for sale, but he put it in the picture window because it was a showstopper. You're walking down the street. Oh, look at that. And you go in and you start looking around, right? Well, 12 o'clock at night, flatbed truck up onto the sidewalk. Whoosh, guys break the glass, grab the jade coffee table. They put it in the back of the flatbed truck and vroom, they head down Hastings. Um... If these fellows were rocket scientists, they'd be working for NASA and making a really good living. Instead, they're trying to rob people. So th this stupid idiot drives through a red light. Rrr, 12 o'clock at night. What's the luck, right? So the cop pulls him over. The one thief turns to the other and he says, look, play it cool, man. I've got the tr insurance papers. Everything's copacetic. The truck's, you know, in my name. All we do is I get my ticket for speeding. We go on our way, Okay. So the cop comes over and he tells the guy, you've gone through a red light. And he says, yeah, I know. He says, my mistake, sure. So the cop's writing out the ticket. All the police officer says is, nice jade coffee table. And the other guy sitting beside the driver bolts out the door, runs down the block, and goes around the corner. The guy sitting at the wheel goes like this and he says, if I think on my buddy, will I get a reduced sentence, right? Honor amongst thieves, you know. I'll run away, but he'll never tell on me. <laughs> anyway, the bottom line is 
ignoring the criminal element, they get the coffee table back. End of story. No, my client calls the insurance agent and says, um, I'm, I'd like to make a claim for the window, which is broken. And the uh, agent says, um, what happened? He says, well, they broke the window and stole the, uh, uh, the jade coffee table. Oh, well, we can pay for the jade coffee table. No, no, we got that back. Oh, okay. Uh, but what about my window? It's going to cost me $8,000 to fix. And the agent's response was, do you have plate glass insurance? My client says, no. He says, I'm sorry, we can't help you. And he says, but it was broken during the robbery. And he said, yes, but they didn't steal the broken glass. <laughs> right? Now, um, we managed to uh, get the insurance company to pay for it. Um, and uh, <clears throat> here, here's what happened. Um, it's long enough ago that statute of limitations, nobody can get into trouble. Not my client, <laughs> the insurance agent. Um, I called up the insurance agent. Uh, oh, no, I called my client. and I, My client said, I don't understand. Why aren't we covered? And I explained to him that he should have said, I need to pay a premium to get plate glass coverage. And my client said, oh, I am so embarrassed. And I thought to myself, okay. Oh, I feel so stupid. Oh, how dumb of me. Oh, I should have consulted a lawyer. Ah, uh, you know, how darn. But, oh, I'm embarrassed. And I said, okay, David, why are you embarrassed? And he said, well, because I, I um, represent, I'm president of the Merchants Association for that area. And I recommended that we use this insurance agent. Okay. And um, this is the very first claim. And it turns out he didn't give us very good advice. So I said, okay, hold on. So I called up the insurance agent and, and I argued that the that, that glass should be covered. And he said, uh, no, no, Mr. Holden, I'm sorry, it's not. And I said, yeah, I guess you will be sorry. And he said, you know, what? And I said, well, you know, David recommended to the Merchants Association that they use you as an agent. And here's the first claim. And it turns out uh, uh, things were not handled as well as David wanted. So I suspect you're going to lose a lot of business. The agent said, well, OK, just, just let me look into this and see if, in fact, the glass might somehow be covered. And he came back a while later and he said, yes, Mr. Holden, tell your client we are going to compensate him for the broken glass less is deductible. Now, I don't know whether in fact it was covered and he just made a mistake or whether he went back and massaged the facts, gave them to the insurance company that he works as an agent for and got them to cover it anyway, okay? So it may be that that was a little inappropriate, but that's on their side, I don't care. I got what my client wanted. Um, so plate glass insurance, you got a big plate glass window, you need it. The next is commercial vehicle insurance. I have a car, I drive it, my wife drives it, my daughter drives it, and we've lent it to a friend once in a while. All those people are covered, okay, by my policy. Um, but if I use that car for business purposes, um, then I'm covered, the car's covered. If we hit somebody, they're covered. Um, but I give it to an employee to drive, and the employee's injured, he will or she will not be covered. This is business. They want more in the way of a premium because you're making a profit, okay, and so they want a little slice of the pie. Um, <clears throat> so my employee is not covered unless I get commercial vehicle insurance. Marine insurance um, covers um, uh, ships, you know, tankers and freighters. It covers um, the, the loading facilities and the ports it covers cargo. Um, we don't have to worry about loading facilities in the port. That's Ports Canada. We don't have to worry about the tankers or freighters because we're probably not going to own any of those. But we will send goods by ship quite often as cargo. So there's a subcategory of marine insurance called cargo insurance. Okay, And if you send goods by container to buyers, then what you want to do is get marine insurance, a cargo policy. Okay, um, robbery, burglary, and theft. Robbery is the taking of somebody else's assets by um, force or threats of force. I got a gun! Give me your money! Give me your money! Give me your assets! Give me your cash out of the room! You know, 
<clears throat> okay, so there has to be this robbery element. Um, burglary is when there's signs of forced entry and the thief gets in and takes something. Theft is just the mysterious disappearance of goods. So somebody got into the business premises somehow and somebody took something, but we don't know how. Okay. Um, there used to be one, one policy uh, writer would cover all of those. Now they're breaking it down. Um, if you're a chartered bank, for example, you will want to get um, uh, robbery and burglary. And, you know, a guy comes in with a mask and a gun <coughs> and holds you up. Or a burglar, you know, digs underneath and, you know, gets into the vault, opens the vault and steals the money. Um, signs of forced entry. Uh, but theft doesn't happen in banks. I mean, how many times have you been able to go into the bank and when no one's le looking, lean across the counter and take money out of the till? You can't, okay? So theft just doesn't happen. Well, yeah, it does, but it doesn't happen by the customer stealing the money. It happens by the teller stealing the money. Okay, but I mean, what is, I mean, there's $4,000 and they've managed to count it out so they've shortchanged you 100 bucks and then they just slip 100 bucks into their pocket. Um, well, um, if, if that happens and you make a, a claim for insurance for theft, you will not get any money. And the reason you won't get any money is because there is specific insurance for employee defalcation, which is theft by employees. Okay. Um, so you have to have fidelity insurance, which is basically a bond we talked about that in HR management, a bond on the employee. You have a retail operation. You have all sorts of very expensive product where the customers come in and they look around. Something goes missing. You want to have a theft policy, okay? But if something goes missing and it's from the back room and customers are not allowed to go back there, then obviously it's one of your employees that is... Um, uh, stealing, okay, and um, they uh, they want to get fidelity insurance on that. London Drugs had a problem not too long ago. I, did, I wasn't involved in it, but I read about it. Um, one of their employees um, who was in charge of cleaning up um, would every once in a while take some very expensive electronic thing, put it in the trash bag, put the trash bag out behind London Drugs, and then he would go off work and then he would come back late at night and he'd drive back there and he'd grab the trash bag and bingo, away he'd go. Um, eventually they caught him, uh, but they had fidelity insurance, okay, so they were, uh, they were compensated. Credit insurance, uh, here's a pitfall for the exam. You have to, you have to listen carefully to this because it might be on the exam. Um, if I have accounts receivable on my book, $180,000 of accounts receivable, there may be a portion of that which doesn't get paid because businesses go insolvent or they're just slippery um, and they won't pay us, um, you know, or something like that. So um, if $20,000 of that is uh, bad debts, <clears throat> you can get credit insurance, which will uh, compensate you for that. Um, <clears throat> Peak Performance Pontoons sells skis, okay, and they sell shipments of skis to various distributors. So they seldom if ever sell a, a pair to a customer and they'd probably get paid by a charge card anyway. But when they sell um, a thousand pairs of skis to um, uh, uh, an Australian distributor, G'day Mate Distributing, um, they, they'll want 30, 60, 90 days to pay, right? Well, and something can happen during that time period and we and peak performance pontoons doesn't does not get paid. Um, so peak performance pontoon says we will send the sh um, the the skis to you and you pay us by way of letter of credit. Remember when we talked about contracts, the eight ways that you can ensure to a certain degree that you're going to get paid. In this situation, it is almost assured that you're going to get paid. Because the letter of credit is a guarantee from the bank that they will pay you, not, not from Gdemi, right? So on a problem on the exam, if the company, uh, I might give you a scenario and say what insurance should this company get? Um, and if they are selling by letter of credit, oh, 
Better get credit insurance, eh? In case that doesn't get paid? No. Letter of credit, you're guaranteed to get paid. So why pay a premium to get insurance against bad debts when if you're careful getting your letter of credit, there won't be any, all right? So um, credit insurance, take a look at your operation, see if you need it. All right, aviation insurance. There was a situation, this is not with one of my clients, but um, this person had a uh, uh, twin engine otter, which is a fairly substantial plane, and was going to um, fly a customer and uh, some equipment from uh, a point in uh, BC to Edmonton, Alberta. Um, the pilot was really well trained, had great uh, credentials, had been authorized and, and certified by the Transport Canada. Uh, so it was a good pilot, but he made an error. We all make errors, and this one turned out to be um, tragic. Uh, he was going to take off early in the morning, and the plane had a certain weight load that it could safely take off with. Hey, the flight got delayed, and um, uh, three other passengers uh, and their luggage and everything got put onto the plane. And uh, later on in the morning, um, the winds died. Okay, you always take off um, into the wind and land with the wind because it gives you better lift and control. Well, by noon, very short runway, no wind. Pilot tries to take off, there's a crash, and um, as it turned out, the um, uh, and pilot suffered a little bit of burn damage. The co-pilot was okay, the three passengers uh, were okay, uh, but the one customer of the, uh, the, the line um, was uh, killed in the crash. Um, he was elderly, he suffered from MS, and... Um, uh, it looked like there was going to be a lawsuit for causing wrongful death. Um, it turned out finally when the dust settled that the spouse of this person said that this last holiday that he'd gone on was going to be his last because he was getting to the point where the MS was going to cause him to pass away anyway. And so in some ways, um, he had had this wonderful experience and then was knocked unconscious and then, and then died in the fire. Uh, it was almost like a blessing. So the, um, the, the spouse elected not to sue uh, the owner of the airline um, and the matter came to an end. Um, however, um, the uh, the owner sent the insurance policy down to a lawyer and the lawyer was looking at it and uh, to determine if the loss was covered, which it was, if there was enough um, insurance to cover wrongful death claim, and there was, and whether there was any money in that policy to allow a lawsuit or uh, legal fees to uh, the company's lawyer to fight the lawsuit, if there was one. Um, and... Um, uh, and everything everything seemed to be fine. Um, now, when the accident happened, it happened in the interior of BC, and uh, the government, in its infinite wisdom, knew that there were only a few people and only one injured, sent out two rescue helicopters. Um, not only that, the, the crash occurred just 20 miles from a town where there was ambulance services, okay? So sending out two helicopters was uh, overkill, and the rescue operation bill, which they gave to the company, was $11,000, all right? And you don't get to argue, well, you know, you shouldn't have sent two hel helicopters. So the owner of the company thought, oh, man, I'm going to have to pay $11,000. Well, the lawyer that was looking at the insurance policy <clears throat> read the whole policy through to the end, and almost the last paragraph said that there was rescue insurance, Okay. And the client had read the policy and got to the part that he wanted and so uh, stopped and then gave it to the lawyer and said, make sure that we're covered. I think we are. Well, he didn't read far enough, but the lawyer did. And the lawyer called up the, uh, the owner of the company and said, and good news, uh, the uh, rescue is covered as well. So two things out of that. Number one is um, you get the insurance policy uh, that you think you're going to need. Uh, and then add to that more insurance than you think is necessary. And number two, read the policy. Okay. All right. So that's aviation insurance. Now, um, that is all the insurance that we're going to talk about that covers um, 
the assets of the business. Now we're going to go to uh, slide, the bottom of slide 211, and look at insurance on business operations. Standard policy, you get public liability and property damage. Somebody walks into your office, <laughs> and sues you, public uh, <clears throat> liability, okay? Um, property damage covers their assets, that sort of thing. The next one, though, is uh, something that we've talked about very briefly, I think. When, yeah, we did when we were talking about shareholders agreements and partnership agreements. And that is on slide uh, 212. Um, and it is uh, insurance on business, or, sorry, um, key person insurance. Um, in a partnership, uh, let's say there's two partners and you each put in $250,000, so you have a $500,000 business and it begins operating. It's probably, you know, gone up in value. If you value it as an ongoing concern, it's, uh, uh, you know, $750,000. One of the partners dies. Um, that can cause you problems in two respects. Uh, the first thing is, let's say that it took two of you to make the $750,000. Now, one of them dies, um, that means the other person now has to do a lot more work or has to go and go to the expense of hiring somebody to cover the deceased partner's work. That's difficult. Um, and then the other problem, of course, is that the estate of the deceased person is going to come and is going to say, um, I want 50% of the value of the business. Now, it's got assets of a half million dollars and an operating profit of $250,000. Take half the assets and bingo, you're only going to be able to do half the work. Okay, so that's a problem. Give it to the estate. And then the profit? Like, um, so it, it could be a disaster. Your business could actually come to an end. So what you want to do is you want to have that partnership agreement. And in there, you want to say that the um, uh, if one of them dies... Um, then what you want is to make sure that that money from the insurance policy is paid into the partnership so it can then be used to pay off the estate. Okay, so you have the partnership agreement and it says that. Um, <clears throat> um, and then you have not only the value of the business, um, but the uh, estate has been taken care of and then you can manage to either find another partner or hire someone. Uh, so, okay, uh, you, you want to have uh, key person insurance um, on a partnership. You want to have death and disability, though, because let's say it's a, um, a wilderness adventure business, okay? So it's a high-risk, uh, um, extreme sport-type business, and one of the two passes away. Um, well, uh, now you, you can't you know, run the business um, with that person gone, um, and so you're going to need this uh, disability insurance, like we said. But what happens if he, he doesn't die? He's just disabled. Well, you have to accommodate that person, which means you have to find something in the operation that he can do. So he's going to handle the office. But that leaves the other partner to do both or all of the adventure tourism work, and that can be a financial uh, difficulty for the business to the point where it could threaten the operation. So you want to have death and disability. Okay, so let's look at another scenario. You don't have a partnership. The two of you are shareholders in a business, okay? And then, um, uh, <clears throat> and you're both directors and both officers. So one of the uh, partners dies. <clears throat> Back up. In a corporation, you are not partners, okay? In a partnership, you are partners. In a corporation, you are business associates, you are um, equal owners, equal shareholders. Call yourself what you want, but do not call yourself partners, okay? If you call yourself partners, all that means is that somebody dealing with you will say, oh gosh, they're partners, I can sue them for joint and joint and several liability, okay? Whereas if they're it's clear that you are a corporation. They cannot sue you at all. They can only sue the corporation if you do your due diligence. Okay, I'm going to harp on that a couple more times. Um, and, and, and the reason is it happens out in the marketplace all the time. Um, I commute to Gibson's. I have to take a ferry. So I get to know people on the ferry. One of them is a business person, 
And he sees me on the ferry and he comes up and he starts talking to me. And he asks me some questions because he wants to get a, a little bit of free legal advice, right? And he says, uh, you know, I've got, you know, my partner and I are, you know, in this dispute. And, um, you know, what do you think? And uh, <laughs> I was a little blunt. I said, well, I think you should probably come into my office, pay me a retainer, give me all the information and we'll take a close, hard look at it. So he said, OK, uh, you know, he agreed. And he gave me his business card. And there's the name of a corporation, something or other, LTD. And then there's his name, and underneath it, it says partner. And I said, uh, Sid, are, do you have a partnership or do you have a corporation? Oh, we have a corporation, but, you know, there's two partners. This is a fairly sophisticated business person, <coughs> and he's making the mistake of calling himself a partner. I said, okay, Sid, you know, the very first thing I'm going to tell you right now is you better come in and talk to me about this because if you call yourself a partner, you're going to get sued as a partnership and the limited liability of the corporation won't work. Oh, you, wow, why? I said, well, that's when you better come in and talk to me because we don't have enough time on the ferry ride to do this. Okay, so it happens out there all the time. Well, that's, you know, my partner. Um, and you're not partners. When we talked about um, the nine things that you could do to use your um, lawyer's time effectively, one of them was not to use the word we. Okay, remember I talked about that elderly couple that came in and they said they were, we are partners in a business. And it turned out they were actually shareholders in a corporation. Okay, so uh, you wanna make sure that you don't make that mistake on the exam and in life particularly. All right, so that's a corporation. You're, you're shareholders and um, one of the shareholders passes away. You have key person insurance and disability insurance, okay? Are you protected? No, you're not. Because let's say the partner that passed away uh, didn't have a husband, didn't have any children, <clears throat> parents passed away a long time ago. Um, the, her next closest relative is some dweeb of a nephew three times removed, and she kind of hopes that he was four times removed, right? So anyway, this young kid, you know, ball cat backers, you know, chewing gum, comes walking in and says, okay, man, um, I'm a 50% uh, owner of the company. Where's my desk? And uh, what do we do? And you go, no way I want to be in business with this person. I've got the key life insurance. I'm just going to pay you off and leave. And he goes, hey, no, man, I don't think I'll sell my shares. This is like a cool uh, thing here. And, and like I hear from my uh, uncle that he's, uh, you know, like, or my aunt that, uh, you know, she was like making a lot of money. So, you know, no, no, you have to. No, no. The shares get passed down to whoever she named in her will. But if she doesn't have a will, then it will go to the dweeb nephew three times removed. So you have to have key person insurance and disability insurance and what else? A shareholders agreement in which both shareholders agree that they must sell their shares through their estate if they pass away. And there's a clause in there that we talked about when we talked about in uh, uh, the contract problem. The annulment clause. <clears throat> this agreement shall enter to and be to the benefit of uh, the parties, the two shareholders, their heirs, uh, beneficiaries, successors, and assigns. Okay, so that means that your representative of, of your estate is bound by the contract that you signed, the shareholders agreement, um, <clears throat> and they must sell the shares, okay? Now, they you cannot put in the agreement, uh, you know, sell the shares for one dollar, okay? No, you have to value the shares every once in a while. <clears throat> <clears throat> Make sure you get the insurance up to that value so that the business has enough money to pay off the estate, okay? Um, and, and if that's not in there, then then you're in real trouble. The, uh, the, the same thing with disability, um, it's a little different. So you say, okay, disability insurance, um, we have an agreement whereby if you become disabled and you cannot function in the job that you were assigned, that you will resign from the business, we'll pay you the disability insurance, and hopefully you can get on and do something <clears throat> valuable with your life um, as it is then. So you want to do that, okay? And then the third situation 
is um, where you have a key person, but it's not one of the shareholders, not one of the directors, not one of the officers of the company, but it's a person who is so valuable to the business that the business would suffer if for some reason they became either disabled and could not work or um, uh, they pass away. Um, let's take a, uh, a scenario where we have an employee who does uh, computer programming. You know, he's just like so totally good at it. Um, you, on the other hand, the owner of the business, um, you know, you get your computer and you go, okay, now there's an on button somewhere. So obviously, if you develop software and sell it, you're not developing it. Your computer geek is developing it. Then you go off and sell it. Well, if anything happened to that person, <clears throat> oh, you just go and get another one. That's not quite as easy as it sounds. <clears throat> you know, first of all, we talked in HR manage about how, management about how you have to have uh, <clears throat> an advertisement. You have to have people fill out applications. You have to check references. You have to interview. Then you select the person, and then you orientate and train them, right? So if you've got this, this contract to deliver some software um, by the end of the month, you may not be able to find someone, bring them up to speed, develop the software, and give it to them by the end of the month. <clears throat> so in there, what you want to make sure is that you have this key person insurance because that will compensate the business for the loss of a key employee. Whoa, that's kind of a neat idea, eh? I've got um, uh, seven people who make my product, and I've got uh, two janitors, um, and I've got, uh, let's see, three secretarial staff. So why don't I get life insurance policies on all of them? Because, you know, the premiums are, are not that high and the odds are that one of them will die and then I'll get this windfall gain. Um, no, it doesn't work that way because um, it has to be someone that's key to your operation. Now, janitorial services are really important, okay? <clears throat> but you can get by for a while without them, and they're relatively um, easy positions to fill through hiring, right? So they're not key employees. So the person has to be key to your operation. Okay, so that's key person insurance. <clears throat> Next on the list are three things, number uh, 13, 14, and 15. We're going to take those together because they cover business operations, but different types, okay? So um, there's commercial liability insurance which covers most businesses that provide services, right? Um, like um, a Sylvan Learning Center, uh, like a restaurant, um, hotel operations, they provide services. Um, and then there's those businesses that sell product. Well, some products are relatively safe, okay? When you buy um, a mouse for your computer, I'm not likely to get <laughs> electrocuted by it. All right, so there are some products that are safe, but then there's others that are quite dangerous. I make chainsaws. <laughs> Even if you use them safely, as we saw with the uh, duty to warn, there's still a danger that people might get injured. So um, you want to have product insurance. Um, pardon me, not in that situation. That would be commercial liability insurance um, or um, uh, just... Uh, public liability. But if if you make the chainsaw and you make it negligently and hurt somebody, um, then then you want to have product liability uh, insurance because, or product insurance, they also called product liability insurance because it covers damages caused or injuries caused by the negligent manufacture of goods. Okay. Okay, so that covers services, and it covers uh, products, and then there's professional services. The recognized professionals are lawyers, doctors, engineers, accountants, and I think dentists and architects, right? <clears throat> now, you're a marketer, and you perform your duties in a very professional manager, uh, manner. That does not mean you are a professional and that you should get professional liability insurance. And here's why. If you get commercial liability insurance, the insurance will be $980,000, uh, $1,200, something like that. If you are a professional 
and you are in one of those professions where they, it is mandatory that you get insurance before you can do the work, your insurance is going to cost something like $25,000 to $30,000 a year. Okay, so you walk into your insurance agent, you say, hey, Bob, how you doing? You say, oh, fine, Peter, uh, what can I help you with? Uh, well, I have a marketing firm and, um, uh, and I do a really professional job and I need insurance. Oh, okay, so we'll give you a professional liability insurance. No, you don't want that, okay? Don't call yourself a professional because if you call yourself a professional, you're gonna have to get professional liability insurance. <clears throat> Tell your customers that you do your work in a very professional manage, manner, but do not tell your agent that you are a professional marketer. You'll just wind up paying too much insurance. Errors and admission insurance. This protects directors and officers of the company. Um, I talked about uh, very briefly the uh, case against the uh, Gibson's uh, Chamber of Commerce, and um, <clears throat> they had uh, the Board of Trade dictates that all chambers of commerce must have errors and admission insurance. And it's a really good idea because in that particular circumstance, had had we not won the case, had they not had a wonderful lawyer, um, had, had they not won the case, uh, there might have been some liability uh, on them as well as on the chamber itself, which is a separate legal entity. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you, um, <clears throat> you, you want to get uh, heirs and admission insurance. Um, and there also, it comes into play in another scenario. Um, every once in a while in life, you will be asked to make a contribution, okay, uh, to society using your prof uh, professional expertise um, in a manner outside of your job. I had one client who was, uh, you know, a really interesting client to have. It was a, a marketing and advertising agency, and they also, that was one corporation. And then they had an event management corporation, um, <clears throat> and then they had... Um, a, uh, a magazine publishing corporation, uh, you know, all under the umbrella of a holding company. Um, and then they had a very clever idea. Um, turn of the century, uh, going from 1999 to 2000, uh, there was going to be a fantastic uh, worldwide celebration and um, uh, on New Year's Eve, right? Well, most people would go, yeah, they have a few drinks on New Year's. Happy New Year! Cheers! <clears throat> and then there's a group of people that don't drink. And... Um, they have, uh, <clears throat> throughout the world, had these um, uh, franchise uh, operations where you put on a non-alcoholic, family-oriented New Year's celebration. It's called the First Night Celebration Society, okay? So <clears throat> the, um, uh, this ad agency gets the license to do this society. And um, they, they, you know, it's called the... Um, Vancouver First Night Celebration Society, and they and they form it, and they incorporate, and they have a board of directors, and they invited Peter Holden to be on the board of directors to make a charitable contribution to um, Vancouver. So I agreed, and then I went to the first meeting, and it was pretty obvious that the reason they wanted me on the board was they were going to need legal advice, and why pay for it if you can have somebody on the board, right? But I didn't mind. I knew that's why I was there. So they said, uh, so what do we need? As well as other insurance, which we can get into, uh, which we don't have to get into, um, I recommended that they get heirs and admission insurance because we were gonna put on this event where um, on the Science Center grounds in downtown Vancouver, we were gonna have people come. And on the event, we had over 16,000 people there, okay? Um, so a lot of things can go wrong and money could be owed and we wanted to make sure we had the heirs and admission insurance. As it turned out, um, as you know, the world turned and um, New Year's occurs at various points, um, the New Year's First Night Celebration Society wanted to televise an event in each time zone, okay? Well, in our time zone, Pacific uh, uh, time zone, um, Seattle was going to have one. First Night Celebration Society in Vancouver was. And they were going to have fireworks shoot off off the Space Needle. Wow. And and we thought, oh, man, how, like, how do we compete with that, right? I mean, the science ball is is, uh, is nice, but it's, you know, not, not the Space Needle. And so it looked like they were going to get the televised um, activity, which we were hoping to get. Um, then they have a terrorist threat down there. 
some terrorists said, oh, great, all those people surrounded around there, we're going to blow up the uh, Space Needle. So Seattle Risk Management said, how do we deal with this risk? They eliminated it. They canceled the celebration. Hooray, that means Vancouver is going to be the celebration that gets on TV. And it's only a three-hour drive from Seattle, so if those terrorists are serious, they might come up here and do it. So we contacted the authorities. We told them the problem. They said they'd watch out. Then we have a board of directors meeting. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, and they said, um, uh, like, what do we do? And I say, well, we double errors in emission insurance because we're going to have to make a judgment call whether we go ahead or not. And we make sure we have event cancellation insurance, insurance, which is number 18 on the list, because we may get up to three days before the event. We've sold tickets, which we've had to pay to get printed. We've got um, uh, um, fencing around the place. We've got security that we've hired. We've got suppliers giving, you know, the stuff. Um, we were going to spend a lot of money before the event even occurred, okay? Um, and so I said we want to make sure we have event cancellation mature insurance in case we have to cancel the event because then we'll get the money in and um, we'll be able to pay, pay off the suppliers. But the air's emission insurance was designed to protect us. As it turned out, um, there was no threat. Um, the uh, We had security there. Um, we went down, 16,000 people. Everybody had a really nice time. And uh, we fired off some fireworks and uh, everything went okay. Uh, but I tell you, I was a little nervous walking around there with 16,000 people and, you know, Looney Tunes out there, terrorist bombers. Anyway, that's errors and emission insurance. Um, rescue insurance, we've already talked about that. It was in that um, uh, policy with the aircraft that crashed. Uh, they do now. Rescue services charge you. Uh, there was another funny episode um, in Vancouver where... Um, one of the executives of a company downtown had a boat, a big yacht. And every Friday, they'd all pile down to the boat and they'd invite guests and they'd all sit there and they would drink, right? And so finally, somebody said, you know, have you ever taken the boat out? And he said, well, you know, not very often. And so they all agreed to come back Saturday and they would go over Victoria. So they come back the next day, they get in the boat and they start going across Georgia Strait, run out of gas. And now they're floating with the tide down Georgia Strait, which goes into the Strait of Juan de Fuca, which goes into the Pacific Ocean, which you don't want to do when you're in a boat without gas. So the fellow can't get the boat going, so he contacts uh, the rescue services. Out comes a helicopter. Frogman jumps off the helicopter in the water, swims over the boat, gets on board and says, what's the problem? He says, uh, I was sure I had enough fuel, but I, uh, uh, it seems like we ran out. Fogman goes, okay, flips the switch underneath the dash, boom, starts up the engine. They had enough uh, fuel. He just didn't know how to run the boat. Um, $9,000 bill for the rescue, okay? Um, so uh, if you've got a business operation and you're doing something like that, you want to have rescue insurance. Um, employee health insurance um, is there, and... Um, you get employee health insurance if you as a business can afford it and you need it, okay? You have a restaurant, um, you cannot afford to give your servers health insurance. It would also be a nightmare in administration because servers come and go and come and go and come and come and go. Um, and because they are relatively easy to replace, if someone says, well, I won't work here because there's no health insurance, you go, bye, okay? There are other places where you want to have health insurance and dental insurance because it keeps the employees there. Um, I, uh, at Kaplan University, we have health, um, medical and dental. I had two young daughters, all the usual work on their teeth, <clears throat> very expensive. I needed a couple of crowns, very expensive, all covered by the insurance at work, which made it very difficult to turn down or for me to accept an offer I got from the University of Hawaii to go over there and teach, okay? Uh, number one is I'd lose my seniority here with the union. Number two, I wouldn't have health and dental for a couple of years, and, they, and it was just a sabbatical position, so I wouldn't get it. Um, and it wouldn't uh, be helping my pension, so I just said, you know, I can't, I can't afford to go. I'd love to teach in Hawaii for a couple of years, but it just was not financially viable. So you get health insurance if necessary. So if I do put a problem on the exam, give you a business scenario, and your employees are easily replaced, 
you don't need health insurance. But if you have um, uh, architects in your firm and um, they, they're a really good working group and you want to make sure you hold on to them, then you've got to offer them these other things like um, medical and dental insurance. There is one other type of insurance, <clears throat> and I just read it in um, a, lawyer's, uh, a Canadian lawyer magazine that was sent to me. And um, it's, it's merger and acquisition insurance. And I'll try to find out the exact name for that. And when I do a summary, I'll talk about it. Um, if businesses are buying and selling, um, and you are about to buy a business, <clears throat> The vendor makes all sorts of representations about no lawsuits against them. Uh, you know, you know this works, that works. The financial statements are correct, and the vendor might be relying on advice being given to him by other people. He may get the wrong advice. He makes these representations. The representations turn out to be false, and the um, company that acquired your company then sues you for misrepresentation, the tort of negligent misrepresentation. Um, <clears throat> so they developed insurance, okay. They had all sorts of, of due diligence before the acquisition actually took place to try to, to prevent any of these problems as, as much as possible. But there's always a risk to the purchaser that there's contingent liabilities that they're not aware of, right? Um, and so it's possible for the vending company to get mergers and acquisition insurance uh, or representation insurance, I'll find out the right name, uh, to make sure that they're protected if they inadvertently make a misrepresentation. Um, the last two, um, one of them I've already talked about, and that's uh, legal expenses insurance. Um, the policy, the... Uh, Policy with that uh, aircraft company um, had a clause in there where they paid an additional premium and um, they were covered to a certain amount for legal expenses if they had to fight a court case, all right? Uh, <clears throat> so we've dealt with that one. The last one, Bailey Insurance, is um, extremely important in situations where um, other people's goods may be on your premises. Let's go back to peak performance pontoons. They sell pontoon skis. Uh, the fins on the skis break. The gyroscopes need to be replaced. Uh, there's a problem with the bindings. The, the, the buyers the, that own the skis, the customers, come in and they go, I would like my skis repaired, please, under your warranty. Okay, so here's our shop. And here's Benton working away with his staff. And there's peak performance pontoons inventory. Okay. And then there's the skis that belong to other customers that are being repaired. That night, there's a break-in. Somebody comes in and steals all the skis that in the inventory and um, steals the skis that are being repaired. Peak Performance Pontoons, Inc. has um, not robbery because nobody's going to come in the door and say, you know, but they have burglary and theft insurance. So, phew. Problem solved, right? No, because uh, burglary and theft will cover Peak Performance Pontoons, Inc.'s inventory, their equipment and inventory. But I don't have an insurable interest in my customer's skis. So as Benton Counter, I had better go out and make sure I get Bailey insurance. What is bailment? Um... <clears throat> The bottom of the slide covers it. It's the transfer of possession, but not ownership, of goods from a bailee, uh, from a bailor to a bailee, on the provision that the goods will be returned in as good a condition, better, or disposed of in accordance with the bailor's wishes. Let's explain that a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> you're getting ready for the exam. You have a textbook, but your friend doesn't. So your friend says, okay, um, are you going to be studying this afternoon? No, no. Okay, can I borrow your textbook? Oh, sure. So you are the bailor. You give your textbook to your friend. You're not saying, here, you now own this. So you're not transferring ownership, just possession. Okay? And your friend has to take the book away 
use it, and then return it in as good a condition as he or she received it. Okay. The second one is where um, I have a watch, and I'm not wearing a watch right now, but I got a really neat watch given to me by my uh, my sister, uh, Joanne. Um, <clears throat> it, uh, there's a Jimmy Buffett song called Breathe In, Breathe Out, Move On, which is my philosophy in life, okay? There is nothing worth committing suicide over, okay? If you have problems, you breathe in, you breathe out, and you move on. Um, and in that song, um, it says, uh, I bought a watch from a crazy man. Um, it has no hands. All it says is now, okay? which is my philosophy of life. Um, you know, you, you, can't, you cannot live in the past. You don't know what's coming in the future. So live for now. Okay. Um, anyway, I've got this watch and it says now. When the battery runs dead, I'm not going to go, oh, and throw it away. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get it repaired. So I'm going to take it down to the repair shop and I'm going to give it to the watch repair man. And I'm going to say, here, this watch is yours. I'm transferring title to it. It's yours now. I'll buy it back later. No, I'm not. I'm going to go here. Here's my watch. I would like you to um, put in a new battery and I'll pay you for it. Okay. So... What I want to do is I want to get the watch back. I'm the bailor. He's the bailey. I want to get the watch back in better condition than I gave it to him. Straightforward. The last situation is where Peak Performance Pontoons is going to sell a shipment of skis to a business in Toronto. So I'm if I took the skis down and gave it to CP Rail and they went by train to Toronto... And the train turned around and brought it back and gave them back to me because they had to give them back in as good a condition or better. I would be really upset. Okay, I want them delivered to the guy in Toronto. <clears throat> so disposed of in accordance with his wishes does not mean take those skis and throw them in the garbage. Okay? Disposed of means deliver them where I want them. So I'm the bailor. I give the skis to CP Rail. They are the bailey, they take it to Toronto, and they dispose of them in accordance with my instructions, i.e. deliver them to the business in Toronto. All right. Two types of bailment. We've already covered it. Gratuitous bailment. When you lent your book to your friend, you did not receive any consideration. Your friend received consideration. He or she got to use the book. But you, in turn, did not get any consideration. <clears throat> so that's like a gratuitous promise. Uh, so that's gratuitous bailment. And then bailment for value is the shop, uh, the watch repair place. Um, I bail my watch with them and they give me the watch back fixed. My consideration is I get the watch back in better condition. Their consideration is that I pay them for it. Okay, so that's basically insurance. Just going to talk about one thing which is not on the slides but might be on the exam, and that's the law of, fi of finders. Um, you walk into a classroom one day, and you go, and you look down, and there's an Apple computer. Nobody's around. You open it up. Hey, wow, I can get into it. Um, <clears throat> so what's your responsibility? Well, this is the law of finders. Um, you can never own that computer. It doesn't matter if no one ever comes to claim it, okay? You can never own it. And the reason is, it was not left there for the purposes of transferring title to you. It was left there by mistake. So the second you pick it up, you become the inadvertent bailee, okay? And the person that left it there is the inadvertent bailor, okay? And it would be incumbent upon you to take reasonable steps to try to find the owner, but because you find it in a classroom, uh, usually um, if you find it in a public place, okay, and a classroom is not public, it's the property belongs to uh, Capital University. If you find it in a public place, like in a, in a park or in a parking lot or, you know, on a bus or something like that, um, <clears throat> then um, you're considered to have better title to it than anyone else in the whole world. So you can use it for the rest of time if you cannot find the owner and the owner doesn't find you. <clears throat> but you can never own it, all right? Um, but if you find it in the classroom, then the owner of the property um, has better title to it than anyone else in the whole world. And then if they don't want it or don't 
take charge of it, then you have better title to it than anyone else in the whole world except the owner. Um, so that's the way it works. And there's an article in the um, uh, in the lecture guide. <clears throat> uh, and uh, I should go to the front and use the index because that's the best way of doing that. Um, let's see. Uh, finder not keeper 14. Oh, so it's right up. Oh, there it is. 14 UK, just before Barton's insurance policy. There was a, an elderly gentleman who found um, some gold coins on a lot uh, owned by the city of North Vancouver. And um, he did the right thing, which he'll never do again, of course. He gave it to the city and said, I found these. And nobody ever claimed them except the city. Okay. And he said, well, I, I found them and, I, you know, I should get them back. And the city said, no, um, that lot was not private or public property. Now, you think things owned by the city would be public, the parks and parking lots and things. Uh, yes, they are. But the lot is real property. And um, while you're allowed to use the parks, you're not supposed to be on the real property. And so he found it on their property and they had better title to, title to it than the whole world. And uh, so he didn't get anything for it. Um, it's disgusting how the District of North Vancouver claims everything that's found, he said. Um, <clears throat> My off-the-cup thought on it is if, I, if someone finds something, depending on what the items are, they are, and if they are not claimed, they should be returned to the finder. Um, if you have better title to it than anyone else in the whole world, which he did not, but it doesn't seem fair, does it? Okay, so um, <clears throat> to finish off the chapter on insurance, oh no, sorry, I'm still going through types of insurance. Okay, so we looked at insurance on your uh, assets of your business, and we looked at insurance on your operations. You have to consider which ones of those you want to get. There are two types of insurance, and there's probably others, but this is the only two we have to worry about, that you have by operation of law, okay? And that's workers' compensation insurance and employment insurance. The second you have employees, you have that insurance. Whereas the first two categories, you make up your mind what you need and what you don't need. This third category, you do not have a choice. Okay, so you the second you have an employee, you have to start paying them uh, workers' compensation insurance and making deductions and sending it to the government for EI. Okay, um, so on the uh, on the exam, if I gave you an insurance problem and I said, uh, you know, they've got the standard policy, okay, public liability and property damage insurance and uh, fire flood and insurance against damage or uh, natural disaster, what else should they get? Then you look through the scenario and you decide, oh, they got a plate glass window, so you need plate glass. They handle events, so they begin an event management and stuff like that. And then I might, and, and if you said, oh, and they, and they should get workers' compensation. Oh, and they should get EI. You don't get any marks for that, okay, because um, you don't decide that you should need that. You automatically got it. Slide 2, uh, 16. Uh, we're going to relate this contract of insurance back to the whole concept of offer and acceptance in contracts to just show you how they interrelate. Life insurance, um, you have to apply for life insurance, pay your first premium and have the policy before you are protected, okay? So if I called up Bob and I said, hey, Bob, I'm going on this trip and I need uh, life insurance. Um, and he said, okay, hey, Peter, you got it. Um, uh, just apply. And so I apply. And he said, all right, uh, you're approved. I go, oh, great. And I get on the plane. And I fly. <coughs> I'm not covered. I have not yet paid my premium and I have not yet received my policy. So, <clears throat> you know, okay, Peter, you're approved. Uh, we'll send out the policy. When you get it, pay the invoice. I get the policy. I pay the invoice. Now I go on my business trip. That begs the question, and you probably have not noticed this um, because you're all young and you don't think about insurance so much as older people do. When you get to the airport, there are vending machines. 
There's one where you can buy those horrible things called cigarettes, unless they've been taken out. Then there's ones where you can buy pop. Um, and then there's ones where you can buy chocolate bars and, and potato chips. And then there's one where you can buy insurance. Okay, so yeah, you, um, you, know, you put in some money, you pull a lever, out comes a policy. How can that possibly cover you? Well, you pulled out the lever, you got your insurance policy, and you've paid your premium before you got to pull out the lever. So you've paid and you got your policy, you're covered. It comes out in an envelope. You might want to write an address on there, put a stamp on it, and mail it to someone. <laughs> my my mother-in-law, Mabel, who likes to be called Sunny, was going on a trip to Greece. And she was at the airport and she thought, oh, yeah, maybe I should get some insurance. So she pulls up the lever, pays the money, gets the policy, gets on the plane, flies there, gets on the plane, flies home, comes into me and says, Peter, here's the insurance policy that I bought at the airport. Do you want to just look at that and see if there's any residual value or did it just cover me on that flight? And I said, okay, you got this when you got on the plane. And she said, yeah. And I said, well, why did you take it with me? And she said, well, because it's my insurance policy. <laughs> Everybody's dead, right? <clears throat> Horrible thought. And the rescuers get there and, oh, look at, oh, a charred uh, dead body. And, oh, look, a policy must belong to her. Okay, obviously you don't take it with you. You mail it to somebody. But you do get covered immediately. All right. Risk management policy will be on the exam. Get a binder. The last two items in the insurance section is more terminology, uh, co-insurance, which I would like you to just read. All right. It will not be on the exam. So, you know, obviously you won't read it. You should. Okay. Because you're trying to learn things as well as being tested on it. Change in risk, though, will be on the, uh, on the exam. Um, <clears throat> once I had an accident with my boat, um, there's now a change in risk, okay? Um, there shouldn't have been, but the one company said, oh, you've had a, a, you know, one accident, so you're more accident prone. <laughs> I wasn't, but... Um, so that's one example of what I mean by change in risk. The other is there may be some change in your operation, which enhances the risk. And what I was thinking of is, um, back to my all-time favorite client, Ray, um, who... Uh, I've talked about it on a number of occasions. Um, Ray imported fireplaces, gas fireplaces from the UK, and then sold them to construction companies on North America. Relatively safe, right? He's not installing them, okay, so there's no problem. Uh, and so he got regular commercial liability insurance. And um, then... Uh, he changed because Canada comes in and the Can Canadian Safety uh, Standard, CSA, says, you know, we should, we should have these vented differently and we should, you know, do this and we should do that for, you know, to protect people. So he had to bring in the fireplaces and then he had to uh, mechanically have some of his employees put in a different venting system. So they had to bend and attach metal and things. And also he found that the fireplaces from England, which had a lot of ornate brass, because that's what they like over there, did not sell as well in Canada, where we like tile and wood, okay? So he would take off the brass and he would put tile and wood on these gas fireplaces before he sold them. And then he would sell the brass because it's really valuable. Well, um, <clears throat> one day he called me up and he said, uh, Peter, I need you to... Uh, uh, come out to my plant on Monday. I said, oh, why, Ray? And he said, um, well, because um, I'm having some Italian uh, business people come over. They have a, a business where they make uh, gas heaters that you attach on the wall of your bathroom and you have hot water, which saves the hot water tank, the big hot water tank, which is important in condominiums because you don't have as much space. And he said, um, I'm hoping to become the exclusive distributor. And so I said, oh, so we're going we're gonna to negotiate a, a distribution agreement. And he went, no, 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 we're just, you know, meeting. And I said, oh, oh, well, then why do you want me there? And he said, well, because I want my accountant there too. And I said, no, Ray, that doesn't answer the question. Why do you want me, your lawyer, and your accountant there? 
And he said, well, these are really important business people. So if I'm there and I have my lawyer and my accountant, I will look important too. So he's going to pay me $225 an hour to be there so that he can look important. Wants to pay me, that's fine. So anyway, Monday morning I wake up and I'm going to drive out to his plant. So I put on a three-piece pinstripe suit and I stand in front of the mirror with a briefcase and I go, Exterpi causi, <clears throat> no, <clears throat> exterpi causi non orator actio, trying to look like a lawyer, okay? And I could imagine somewhere in Vancouver, there's an accountant who's in a three-piece pinstripe suit standing in front of the mirror going, just kidding. Anyway, we go out there, we meet with our client, we meet with these uh, business people from Italy, um, they tour the plant and everything, and then there's a lot of shaking of hands, and then they go away. The accountant goes home. I turned to Ray, and I said, Ray, um, I see there's changes in your operation. It used to be the incomes of fireplaces, and the only risk was that the workman might pick it up to send it off somewhere and, oh, hurt their back, covered by WCB. But now I see that you're working with the metal and doing venting things and you're putting off on tiles and stuff and you got this big vat of molten glue. Uh, you know, what happens if the molten glue explodes and glues some uh, customers or employees to the wall? He says, oh, don't worry, I've had insurance for years. I said, well, let's take a look at your policy. So we went into his office and his office looked like a bomb went off in there. There were papers everywhere, just piled files, papers and, you know, you know notes and pieces, you know, oh, it was, it was like, I went, he walks right over and goes, you know exactly where his insurance policy was, how he knew, I don't know. He gave it to me and it had public liability, property damage insurance, and it had uh, fire, flood, and uh, damage against natural elements. And I said, Ray, that doesn't cover this. Um, you have um, a change in risk that has not been brought to the insurance company's attention. And in there, there's a clause that says, if a change in risk occurs and it is not brought to the attention of the insurance company, your policy is void. And he went, oh my God, he said, I've been doing business for three years without any insurance, okay? Um, so that's one clause. There's another clause that is a little nicer, okay, and it says um, if there's an accident and the accident or damage that occurs um, does not relate to the change in risk, then you're covered. But if the damage that occurs results from something related to the change in risk, then your policy is void, okay. But still, if there's a change in risk, you bring it to the attention of the insurance company. Um, it can work both ways. And I've been, you know, I, I beat up on insurance companies quite a bit. So let me just tell you a good thing. My wife begins to run the bed and breakfast operation, right? So we have two B&B &B rooms here. And um, they have, uh, and there's a fire detector out in the hall. And then there's the center unit <clears throat> where there's a lounge up top with a big screen tv and a library and and games that people can play and then downstairs there's uh, two bedrooms one that was operational and the other that was just a storage room and then this side of the house there's the upstairs where we live and then downstairs where the kids bedroom and i said you know for the cost of um, fire detectors um, uh, we've got one in the kids bedroom we've got one in our part of the house um, why don't we put um, one in the center part and one in the hallway, the entrance way, and get one of those um, carbon monoxide detectors as well. And we did, and we sent that information to the insurance company just to let them know we'd done it, and they sent us some money back. They said because we had reduced the risk, um, they were going to give us a bit of our premium back. Okay, so there are companies out there that are really well run and they're very fair and they take care of you. Um, it's just uh, that there are these other problems that you have to be aware of. Okay, so <clears throat> that is the uh, completion of the insurance portion of this chapter. Uh, now the next portion is uh, part two, um, starts with slide uh, 218, and it is intellectual property. 
the intellectual property is covered in a video that I did a few years ago. And um, I think I've mentioned that um, it is on um, uh, eLearn as well. And it might make reference to a uh, different chapter number, and it might make reference to a different section number of law. But the material is exactly the same as what's in uh, uh, the uh, textbook and what we teach uh, now. So um, watch that video, okay? Um, and then the last part of the chapter is on um, estate planning, and so we'll have a separate video for that. And so that's all for today.